Mr. Newman, do I have your full attention? No. Do you think I deserve it? What? Do you think I deserve your full attention? I had to swear an oath before we began this deposition. I don't want to perjure myself, so I have a legal obligation to say no. Oh, okay. No, you don't think I deserve your attention. I think if your clients want to sit on my shoulders and call themselves tall, they have the right to give it a try, but there's no requirement that I enjoy sitting here listening to people lie. You have part of my attention. You have the minimum amount. The rest of my attention is back at the offices of Blank Check Productions, where my co-host and I are podcasting things that no one in this room, including and especially your clients, are intellectually or creatively capable of doing. Did I adequately answer your condescending question? John Getz looks mad at you right now. John Getz looks furious. John, John, Getz, John Getz is shaking his head. John Getz mad. Okay. <laughs> John was happy John Getz mad. John gets mad. John gets sad. John gets sad. This is this is like a baby a, a baby book that I'm reading. John gets happy, and it's just pictures of middle aged character actor John gets doing emotions. This is we should we should you should make a thick cardstock mm -hmm. baby board, maybe one of those plush books. Those are good. So they're soft, so she can you know your those daughter can go to sleep nuzzling my jo John gets feels things. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. John I guess Getz? it's called John Gets Blank. John Gets Blank. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it's just called John Gets, and it's just it's just this headshot. His his professional headshot is on the cover of the book. When it's John from, like, sees Scholastic. puppy, John gets happy. Um, this what is a an weird episode on John Gets. This, episode. this is an episode on Blood Simple Actor John Gets. Yes. Uh, apparently, uh, he was in the Fatal Attraction series recently. Did you know they did a new Fatal Attraction series? Yes. Well, because uh, no, yep, Paramount Plus. Li oh. Lizzie Kaplan not being in Party Down is because of two things. One, Fatal Attraction, the series, which everyone loved, digested. Everyone was just talking about. We it. got nourishment from it. I I totally missed this. <laughs> no, you yeah, didn't. you. I ben, mean, you didn't. You, you watched didn't. it four times. <laughs> no, right, oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you I forgot. No, I mean, you tried to miss it, and then it it popped up on your TV, and it said, yeah. "I don't want to be ignored." Ben. Yes, I won't be ignored. It was the first limited series to exist exclusively in pop-up ads. <laughs> uh, what's the other reason? Don't ignore she, me. Other reason she wasn't in. Uh... Well, Fleischman got in trouble. Ah, Fleischman. Topical. Speaking of Fleischman, right? Speaking of Fleischman, John Getz who I feel like has this reputation where it's like, oh, and, and like the lead from the Coen Brothers' first movie. Right, what happened to the other guy in the Coen Brothers? You know, oh, Francis McDormand's in Blood Simple. That's cool. You know, I'm at Walsh. That's cool. Right, someone was saying this to me recently. Like, and that's so weird. The lead in that movie, like, never worked again. I'm like, you've seen that guy 80 times. You just never clock it's the same guy. And he's always looking at at Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. Just with the kind of like, ah, this you're ruining my case. In every man. movie and for like 20 you're 30 up the years. Settlement price every time you do one of these Sorkin monologues. For 20 30 years he was in movies looking at Mark Zuckerberg exasperated and people said, "John, this doesn't read. Zuckerberg's not a character in this film. This energy's being wasted. Look at the other people in the scene." And he went, "Someday mm -hmm. there's going to be a Zuckerberg in that chair over there. You'll see. You'll see." And they're like, well, that's fine, but you're fired. You're fired. <laughs> no, he works all the time. He's great. This is great in this. He's great in this. Number one performance in this with a bullet. This no is our take. This is our take. This is our hot take. We have no guests on this episode because we need to get straight to our hottest take. Ready? I'm gonna even hype what you're saying. The only good performance in the <laughs> social else, network. Dog shit. Dog shit. gets drags this movie to a B minus. Phoning it in. <laughs> John Getz. What if that's what we did? We were like, we have no guests for the social network because we need three hours to poop on it ourselves. Yes. And boost gets. <laughs> and boost gets. Yes. Uh, he's going to get his flowers in this episode. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It's a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce Baby, mm -hmm. this is a mini series on the films of David Fincher, and it is titled <clears throat> Curious Pod of Benjamin Buttcast. 
V. Here's. Nope. Drop the V. It's cleaner. There you go. I was setting you up there. Thank you. It was a little oop. Thank you. Uh, today we're talking about the social network. Mm-hmm. The movie that, well, it's odd because on one hand, he was a guy who got to do what he wanted the way he wanted to do it. Uh, okay, sure. But this is the movie that finally kind of solidifies him as like, oh, Fincher, the movie's a hit. The critics love it. It's an Oscar heavy hitter. He's at the, the top tiers of the conversation now. Right. I feel like often with him up until this point, all three were not in sync, right? Right. You have movies like Seven that are a huge hit, mm-hmm. but it's not an Oscar movie and critics dismiss it a little bit. Keep going. You're you totally right. Zodiac, critically beloved, but bombs in theaters, gets no nominations. Yeah, and I th- I do think it's it's critical love only grew over time. Totally. I think it was critically uh, respected on yes. release. Yes. Uh, 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 Panic Room hit. But well, kind yeah, of she hit him with a sledgehammer. She hit him with a sledgehammer. Yoakum. Treated as a programmer. Yeah. No, which it totally. was by design. Uh, then Benjamin Button's his Oscar breakthrough. Mm-hmm. The critics are a little... Critics are a little tepid. Everyone's a little, a little tepid in yes. a way. Right. And then this is the movie where it's like, Fincher's kind of assumed his place in film culture that people maybe since the early 90s had been predicting he would. Mm-hmm. And it starts uh, the the most kind of uh, successful three film run of his career before the industry collapses. Sort of true. Yeah. I guess the, his run from Zodiac to Gone Girl, I do think is the peak of his career. And in terms of just uh, cultural sort of being, being culturally locked in. Uh, yes. Right? Uh, not that he was doing badly before that no. run and not that he's really been doing badly after that run. It's just been more TV, obviously. Yes. And we'll talk about it in future episodes, but it is one of these uh, things that is is kind of uh, bleak in terms of looking at the industry. We can also discuss part of it is career decisions that uh, he made that shifted the winds of the industry along with him. I suppose so. He, yeah, he you does, mean like starting Netflix, basically yeah, by mistake, yeah, almost. He kind of hoists his own petard in a certain way. But I mean, nobody, nobody knew it was like, oh, we don't look. We can't talk about no, no. But that. there's just a fascinating thing of like social network, Gone Girl, uh, uh, social network, Dragon Tattoo, Gone Girl, right? Mm-hmm. And then why does it take so long for him to make another movie? Wow. He has multiple TV shows shut down in that time. He has films he can't get off the ground. That's part of it. He starts yeah. attaching himself to things where you're like, why would Fincher want to do that now? We'll talk about it. Yeah, of course we will. Um, but this is the movie where it feels like, oh, now he's just going to keep being undeniable. And then it, it only lasts so long. Sure. Well, you know, not, not by his are own. finite. Dust yeah. in the wind. Social network. And also... The social network. You know, this film probably should have won Best Picture, but yes. a certain king had to speak. Yeah. Well, with great difficulty. I know. Give him some credit. It was not an easy speech to make. Uh, no. I, I, honestly, I salute him for working so hard in his speech. It's fine. I just don't know that he needed an Oscar for it. He was already king yeah. of all England. Yeah. You know? I think you like that movie more than I do. I mean, I think that movie is undeniably a, a watchable good time. I agree with that. Right. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what you mean. I, I don't really have a ceiling for it beyond that. I guess it's sort of a good version. There are certainly worse versions of that kind of movie. Many yes. that were made after that movie. Yes. Because it won Best Picture and was kind of a box office phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think, yeah, you know, it's pretty good. Right. That's the other wild thing is that Social Network was a big hit, but like uh, King's Speech made twice as much. Uh, I we can talk. I can I can look during the box that was. Yeah, it certainly did very well. I want now. I want to see where I had the King's Speech on my list in 2010 because I have the Social Network at uh, number one mm. of 2010. I have King's Speech at number 40. You uh picked Social Network as your movie of the decade. I'm gonna drop King's Speech down a couple just as we. It's too high. Yeah. Just to smack it down. You you had Social Network as your top film of the 2010s. I think that it makes sense as the best movie of the decade, even though it's at the start of the decade. Yes. I mean, there's I I, I, I calling things the best movies of the decade sure. is very we're getting really fungible, yeah, whatever. No, but yeah, it, look, I think it, it, makes it sense. is it is uh one of the most rewatchable films of modern history. Yeah. 
uh, and I rewatch parts of it a lot uh, as much as I watched the whole thing. But this is one of those films where, because I knew it was coming up on the schedule, I have sort of been, been edging. edging. Yeah, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Been edging. I want you to know, I was not planning on saying that. Only as I got halfway through the sentence, I went, you were gonna should I go to edge instead of abstain? Back, back in April, you flipped your calendar over to September and wrote, like, on, on this day, edging. And I say edging when uh -huh. talking about social network. Uh, I just, point is, I don't know the last time I watched it in full. Sure. Although I've seen it a number of times. And uh, watching it again last night, not that I don't give this movie credit, my mind, I was just like, Jesus Christ, were they ahead of fucking everything? Not just, it's just right. It's a harbinger of everything. Absolutely. How, yeah. the, how culture works because when yes how uh also just a hugely influential movie like just just in there are so way. many movies that are yes. trying to do this yes then never will be able to come close obviously no uh and i saw and enjoyed dumb money um just the other week yeah bob my review of it and that is a movie that is it's not it's not like there's nothing about that movie's attitude that's like this is a, the next social network, but the the attitude of that movie is like social network. We're we're gonna try. It becomes to, a genre. To social, it's a genre. It becomes a genre. Yep. I, look, I've I've talked about my love for it before on this podcast. I think BlackBerry is the only thing that has come close in the now 13 years since this movie came out. Oh, I think there are others, but BlackBerry's good though. Yeah, that's a good example. There's stuff like Moneyball you can say where it's like Moneyball gets the boost from well, Moneyball and Steve Jobs. A Sorkin rewrite we coming don't, after this. Don't count those, right? Because no. those are Sorkin scripts. So right. yeah, 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 that's a little, right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think the big short, which is not a movie I love, is the most obvious movie yes. that's ripping off the social network, even though people maybe don't make that connection enough. And now the big short is seen as a template. And I'm like, mm, no, it's version 2.0. I mean, uh, yeah, but Big Short's adding other stuff into yeah, this. Yes, it is. Stew. Bad things. Right. It's Largely, like you have yeah. a nice big stew and then the Big Short's like pouring in like some junk. Yeah. In my opinion. I mean, whatever. It's okay. Whatever. Maybe whatever. we'll cut all this out. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I think what, you know, when I saw this movie at the time, what was impressive to me was like how quickly it had digested culture and processed it with a kind of clarity, right? Because like Dumb Money, I, I probably will have seen by the time this episode comes out. But at the time we're recording, it's just going into... It's coming, it's, it's widening this week, I believe. Right. Yeah. And it's one of those things where you're like, how are we already making movies about things that happened during the right. pandemic, I have a during whole lockdown? About, I have a whole take. Of course. Yeah. But I'm like, I, I, and as much as I expect to, to find Dumb Money fun... You may not. I mean, yeah. might be your least favorite thing of all time. Possibly. I mean, if Fast X came out this year. It's not going to be my least favorite wow. thing of all time. I don't expect that the movie is going to make some like huge trenchant point about the way we live now that seeps into my entire No, movie. no. Nothing's going to be the social network. Maybe ever again. That's okay, but... I just like, at the time I was like, how, how incredibly precise and quickly they process the things that just happened and the world we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And then I think in certain ways that I don't even know if I can give them credit for, they just, it feels like this movie has coded into it an understanding of where we were going. Ben, what do you want to well, say? Well, Ben Mesrich, the writer yes. of the book that Dumb Money is based on. Uh -huh. Producer Ben speaking here, yes. Um, he wrote he wrote the book that this book is, movie is based the on. The Accidental yes. Billionaires. And yeah. The book that dumb money. Oh yes, it's yeah. called um, the anti-social network. Yes. Look, I I don't want to speak ill of Ben Mesrich, but he is an absolute hack who turns out one of these a year, yes. basically to get them option to make movies. Have you seen the Wikipedia photo? It's terrible. <laughs> it's not great. It's one of the worst. But he's from New Jersey. Well, I know he's, he's a New giving, Jersey Ben. He's giving. It's not a good photo. <laughs> yeah, it's not giving, a great photo, right. and it's also New Jersey vibes, years old. but in a bad way. Right, he wrote sure. Twenty One as well. Yeah, he wrote. Right, he's written a lot of things that have been yes. turned into movies. Yes, and then you pick up the book and you sort of flip through it, and you're like, "Oh, this is barely a book. Yes. This is basically just fodder for look uh, I mean, the screen." Not to get ahead of the dossier, and I'll ask in advance for permission to let me be frank. David? Uh, please be frank. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 go ahead, uh, go gentlemen ahead. of the Senate. But wait a second. There are no crimes in podcasting. Um, Kevin Spacey, 
bought the rights to Ben Mesrich's book that became the movie 21, which he co-starred in and produced, set up at Sony. Mm -hmm. And then basically a couple years later, the word comes out that Ben Mesrich is writing Accidental Billionaire. And uh, Spacey basically gets the rights before the book has even been finished. Yes, 100%. Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin starts is, writing before the book is finished. Right. Yeah. Like, this movie is being developed in tandem with the book, even though the book comes out first and they purchase the book's rights. The book, the book eventually came out, like, a, a year before this movie came out. We'll right. talk about it. You know. But it, it's basically like, this movie is using the same research that the book has called, rather than Aaron Sorkin reading this book and using it as a template, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm saying Ben Mesrich is a little bit, got a little lucky on his credit for this movie and the money he was probably paid for but it. He's, he's but he was there at the right time. Well, he, and also he's been, it, he's cashing that check for going yeah. forward. I mean, maybe yes. he's a huge blank in, in which case I apologize, Ben Mesrick, and I'm sorry that we fucking slammed all over your Wikipedia picture. Um, try and maybe change it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things like if you're the guy who's there at the right time maybe we should change it for him <laughs> yeah actually let's get in there let's get in the, uh, you're there at the right tools time, here you're on the ground you're doing the research whatever it is right yeah and then you basically just like have your publishers go to all the movie studios and go like he's working on this subject now they're just like let's just buy the rights before anyone else does i mean that's what they did with dumb money yes that's 100 percent what they did with dumb money Correct. uh look all right. The Social Network, a the major film Network. from David Fincher. Wait, he was the co-host of season three of the World Series of Blackjack mm. on the Game Show Network? Sounds great. That's he great. represented Massachusetts as a contestant in the Sexiest Bachelor in America pageant? Sure, I was in that pageant too. I moved to Wyoming. I carpet bagged <laughs> just, just to get in there. But then there's got to be a better picture of him. <laughs> Probably. Keep talking, David. I'm going to search. Uh, that sounds good. Um, this film... Um, comes after a fairly busy period in Fincher's life. Mm -hmm. You know, Zodiac and Button come out back to back years. Yes, and those are two pretty massive projects. Two films that were years in the making, exactly. And so, uh, that had kind of stopped. I would say that had been a temporary cure. Fincher's case of the Attaches goes into remission for mm. a while because he's yes. actually working on two yes uh, uh, long running projects. But Please remind the listeners what you mean by attaches. His name being like th attached to a million different, you know, sort of up and coming or long gestating Hollywood scripts. Or Torso. Products. Well, that's okay. So that's the thing. Post button. It's like, all right, buddy, you finally got your Oscar nomination. This was yeah. a hit. What do you want to do? One of them was an adaptation of Brian Michael Bendis's graphic novel, Torso. Torso. Um, uh, a script by Aaron Kruger. That had a killer cast attached. Uh, Cast was going to be Matt Damon, Casey Affleck, Rachel McAdams, Gary Oldman. Uh, and Torso is a sort of different take on Elliot Ness, the, who we all know from mm -hmm. The Untouchables and the Al Capone thing. And it's sort of a true crime thing uh, about these torso murders. It's a very cool graphic novel. Uh, Fincher wanted to shoot it in black and white. Project falls apart because of that. Mm -hmm. Supposedly. David Supposedly. Lowry, friend of the show, has yes. also been attached to Torso at some point. Really? Many years ago. Wow. Uh, uh, Brian Helgeland wrote a script for Paul Greengrass at mm -hmm. one point. Never really materialized. Um, okay. Another thing. In 2007, Paramount uh, acquires the rights to some little graphic novel called The Killer. Never happen. It'll never happen. Wait a second. Mm. Yes, it will. Oh. Check in with us in okay. a month. Uh, that is Fincher's latest film. Um. Variety in 2008 reported that Fincher, and I remember this and being hyped for this, oh. was going to direct an adaptation of Charles Burns' graphic novel, Black Hole. Book that rules. Really, really good. I feel like we've novel. recommended it to Ben several times. Yeah, and I haven't read no, it. No, it's Reliable. a book you'd love. I'm uh, looking at Torso. That This looks sick. Yeah, Torso is cool. Uh, Black Hole, bunch of kids in like Pacific Northwest uh, start to get weird. Yes. Sort of body modifying, diseasey. It's all a metaphor, but like all kinds of weird stuff starts to happen to them. It's cool. But, but that announcement coming, you know, less than a year after Zodiac, I'm in the mode where I'm like, this is exactly what I want to fucking see him do. Mm -hmm. uh, that has since, you know, passed through Alexandra Aha. Rick um, Famuyuma. I think Yuma, it's most never, recently never attached. Pass. Yeah. Um, then uh, there's rumors that Fincher might do an animated film 
based on some stories from Heavy Metal Magazine. Well, Obviously, was, there are Heavy yes. Metal movies, you know, that have been made. But this was, I think, going to be uh, an omnibus movie. Right. Kevin Eastman, yes. Tim Miller, Zack right. Snyder. Uh, Kevin Eastman is... is uh, No, he... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Del Toro, Verbinski, James Cameron. You know, a lot of names have been, like, attached to this thing. Because this is also the time that he starts boosting Tim Miller really hard. Tim Miller, who eventually makes the Deadpool movie, but worked with Fincher a lot and did a lot of his uh, title sequences and such. Mm-hmm. He announces at one point that he's going to produce a CGI uh, adaptation of Eric Powell's The Goon. That's the other thing. If fucking Fincher's attaching himself to comics left and right at this point in time. Um, yeah, well, he... Whatever. He's smart. Eric he Powell's knows. The Goon, which rules. Okay. That's and, not in the dossier. Okay, well, I'm just telling you this. This okay. is the thing I know. Okay, he knows. Because he was a good director. Okay. But it felt like he kept on trying to generate projects for Tim Miller. And Heavy Metal was one of those to sort of boost Tim Miller to video... Uh, from video game, animatic, and opening credit sequence, special effects guy to actual filmmaker. The other thing, and this is funny, mm-hmm. one point Fincher was attached to a movie called Seared, mm-hmm. which later becomes a television show called Kitchen Confidential because it is based on Anthony Bourdain's writing. Yes. But then Fincher gets attached to a different project called Chef. Not the John nope. Favreau Chef. Nope. A different restaurant set romantic comedy with Keanu Reeves mm-hmm. attached to star. Fincher described it as good and chewy, a celibate sex comedy, if that means anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that transmutes and takes form and eventually becomes burnt. Yes, the movie the Bradley that, Cooper starring right. uh, Chef movie. Cooper basically makes Cooper at the peak of his power. The star of Kitchen Confidential. Not the star, but uh, right. a, no, he was the star. He was the yeah, star. Yeah, he he played Bourdain. Star. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of people in that show, so it's fun yes. to think about. But that's like, Ben, just weird cultural artifact. Bradley Cooper was on a Fox sitcom in which he played Anthony Bourdain. It was a flop. A couple uh, years before it became a movie star. Didn't with a, really, you know, had an all-star cast. Stack supporting cast. Really, like John Cho you know, was on it. Right? John Cho, I've Nicholas Brendan, John Daly, Bonnie Somerville. It lasted less than a season. Yeah. And then and like, it was set in a kitchen? It yeah. Was, it, it, was, was, it was based on Bourdain's book. Keep it. It's confidential. Jamie King. Yes. You know, Frank Langella. But like a total flop, right? Okay. And then uh, like 10 years later when Bradley Cooper's at the peak of his stardom, He's like, all this fucking work I put in again, ready to play Bourdain. Yeah, right. I can I still... I want to put it to good I use. Cut I cut a whole bag of still, onions. Exactly. Yes, I can still movie. make mirepoix better than anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so he finally gets his hands on this script that Fincher and Reeves and other people had wanted to make for so long. And he makes it, it comes out like within six months of American Sniper. Uh, Sure. No one yeah, gets Yeah, 2015. No one wanted yeah. to get burnt. No one got burnt. You burnt. That movie sucks. Yeah, and that um, movie also has an insane supporting cast. It does. It's 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 it should be good, and it's just not. It very eats good. ass. It does kind of eat ass. In two thousand and eight, Ben Mesrich, possibly hot off the hottest bachelor competition. I'm not sure when that was. Griffin. Uh, two thousand. Okay, so much right, he's not really hot off it. No, yeah. he's maybe settled down at this point. Uh, gets an email at two a.m. in the morning. That's right. A.m. means in the morning. Mm-hmm. That says, I'm a Harvard senior and I have a fantastic story for you. Uh, this email is from Eduardo Saverin. Uh, he tells the whole story from mm-hmm. his perspective of the launch of Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg screwing him out of the company, in his opinion, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Mesrick gets excited. He turns this quickly into a book proposal, The Accidental Billionaires. Uh, the proposal is what gets, right. you know, circulated through Hollywood. Scott Rudin. Right, it's just the him. proposal. It's just the proposal. And it ain't that Sandra Bullock movie mm-hmm. either. No. Uh, uh, S- Scott Rudin finds out that he wants the rights. Turns out they're already um, owned by Mike DeLuca and Dana Brunetti. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than fight over the rights, Brunetti and uh, DeLuca bring Rudin on board, probably because he was holding two phones in his hands ready to throw. I, no, I'm sure it's because he asked very nicely. <laughs> Uh, Rudin, to his credit, uh, is like, this will be great for Aaron Sorkin. I guess, you know what? I shouldn't say that's to his credit because like, I guess a lot of people in 2008 probably would have, nine would have been like, oh, Aaron Sorkin might be a good yeah, writer. Yeah, was also like one of Scott Rudin's three default it was, modes. It was. Aaron Sorkin had written a oh, screenplay. What if, what if Aaron Sorkin wrote this? Had written a screenplay called The Farnsworth Invention about the invention of TV, which is one of those like famous, like never made into a movie. Was it produced got, it on turned Broadway. Into, was turned into a play eventually. Yes. yes. Uh, never saw it. Uh, the play was good. Click. 
Yes. Return Hank Azaria and Jimmy Simpson cool. did on Broadway. And so Sorkin, in his classic way, mm-hmm. with all of these projects, with Steve Jobs, with Moneyball, like any, any big movie he's written, I don't know anything about Facebook. I don't know anything about Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know that I've ever even heard of Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know anything about, you know, this world. Yes. But he cracks the, the book and he's like, three pages in, I want to do this. I, Wait, he cracks I, the proposal. Cracks the proposal. Yeah. And he's like, wow, Reynolds and Bullock have a lot of chemistry. Yeah. This is good. Um, no, he he's immediately like, I really get it. Even though I'm not on Facebook, this you know has all the elements of great storytelling, friendship, loyalty, class, jealousy, betrayal. Mm-hmm. Uh, struck me as a big classic story. Uh, he signs up and gets a Facebook page. Uh, starts posting Minions memes? <laughs> really... As much as this is technically an adapted screenplay and Sorkin wins adapted screenplay, mm-hmm. uh, he didn't have the book. Right. So it's not really. Like, he's no. basically going off some notes, yes. you know, like, and sort of a general structure. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't really have much to do with the actual book that exists. Mesrich's book is, is really Eduardo Saverin's point of view. Yes. Sorkin is way less interested in that. I would say that Saverin is sort of the protagonist of this movie, kind of, but like not really. Like he's maybe where the audience's sympathy lies yeah, the most say, when you're watching it the first quote time. Unquote, the heart of the movie, but, but, I, but uh, it's a multi protagonist. And but also like there's lots of stuff from the Winklevoss perspective, and yeah. you know, like it's not really a single protagonist movie. No, uh, and no. obviously Eisenberg is like the lead of the film. That's yes. undeniable. Um, and uh, Saverin then as this book is coming out and then this movie is coming out, basically goes into hiding because his lawsuit with Zuckerberg reaches ahead, mm-hmm. settles, he signs an NDA, Saverin then moved to Singapore because he doesn't like paying taxes. Uh-huh. Um, so Saverin kind of disappears. Yes. Um, uh, apparently, when the movie was released, he did get in touch with Scott Rudin and was like, I'd like to see it. And they like, you know, give him a private screening. Okay. But that's kind of it. Yeah. The, the book itself is like poorly regarded, I would say. Yeah. And but once when you read it now, it not, and, yes, no, it ends, when book. you read it now, it basically ends with like, anyway, who knows what will happen because all this stuff is tied up in litigation. And you, it feels like you're just sort of reading like a sketch of a book. Like, yes. you know, you're kind of like, oh, well, this is just like, it's also like, as good as this movie is, it's talking about the very beginnings of Facebook. And that's it. Like, you know, it's ending with them having 1 million users. Like, it's it's really just the germ of Facebook. Well, the big thing is that Sorkin gets access to the transcripts of the depositions. And, um, you know, and to a lot of, like, emails that Zuckerberg sent. and Yes. Uh, because this was all part of the lawsuit. But that's always a big thing he's pointed out is like a larger that's percentage of on. the movie that people, than people would uh, expect is me just using direct transcripts verbatim. Right. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of Sorkin dramatization here, right? And there's, there's Sorkin creation here. But also a lot of the stuff is like, because obviously a big part of this movie is Zuckerberg starts going like, they got me totally wrong. I never would do any of this. I never acted like this. And Sorkin could always point out and be like, that's like, I lifted that. Sure. There's, there's stuff that he's lifting. From a transcript of what you said. Lifted. I mean... In front of lawyers. Well, okay. So, yeah. all right. Rudin goes to Facebook uh-huh. and says, uh, would you want to cooperate in any way? Could we get Zuckerberg to yes. talk to Sorkin? And they, uh, Facebook says, well, you'd have to not call the company Facebook in the movie and it would have to not take place at Harvard. And they're like, well, all right, okay. well then, forget it. Okay. <laughs> um, Sorkin doesn't really care about that. Uh, like, that he didn't get to, like, hang out with, you know, Zuckerberg or whatever. And mm-hmm. he's just like, I just think of this as, like, a shy and awkward and sort of aggressive in ways, you know, not fitting in 19-year-old. I get that, you know. Yes. He, he claims Sorkin's idea is basically like for basically the entire movie, he's an anti-hero. At the end, he's kind of become a tragic hero. He's not a good guy. Um, but, it you know, Sorkin says, and he's always talking in this kind of florid language, I try to write like he's making his case to God, why he should be allowed in heaven. Yes. Mark's line, if you were the inventor of Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. That's coming from me, Sorkin. That's me unzipping myself and stepping out and shouting at every single hack who comes out of the woodwork and says... 
10 years ago, I wrote the script that absolutely nobody read anything about, but it also had a scene in the Oval Office, so you stole it from me. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were the writer of the American president, why isn't your name on the American president? Yeah. Aaron Sorkin. Big chip on his shoulder, even though he's pretty much the most successful Hollywood screenwriter of my lifetime. And that's why he's so good for this movie. And for Steve Jobs, he's so good at writing egotists. Y yes, yes. I mean, I, I guess I want to start seeding this through here, okay? I, I, apple seed over here. I, I, I regrettably spent some time on uh, uh, Reddit this week. Disgusting. Uh, hive of scum and villainy. Yep. Uh, but someone in the blank check subreddit was, um, there was, there was a good discussion going on. Was the live Kinsey scale going on the, the left sidebar? Sorry, Yeah, carry people on. were getting horned. After listening to this episode, I'm moving David up to a four, Griffin down to a two. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Wait, I sh we should be doing the, the voice. Sorry, we have our voice. Oh, so. oh, 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 oh. I mean, could they really talk like this? Who oh, got them the right? All right. Uh, what, what, what were you doing on Reddit, you disgusting freak? I apologize. That's my fetish. My humiliation it's fetish. the worst kind of humiliation fetish, yeah. being humiliated by Reddit. No, this was a discussion I found very interesting, and it's been uh, kicking around in the old bing bong in the week leading up to doing this episode, rewatching the movie, you know? People were saying, like, what's interesting about the social network and what probably makes it work so well is the push and pull between Fincher and Sorkin, not just as artists, right, which I feel like is much discussed, but their differing views of Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. And I forget which take was put out first, but like, well, Sorkin loves the guy and Fincher's clearly kind of terrified by the guy and that contrast works. And then someone made a really good case for the exact opposite. Right. Right? Right. And it was going back and forth and no one could settle it. Right. And both cases are equally convincing. I right? think both people probably identify with a lot of Zuckerberg. Yes. In, you know, Zuckerberg in this movie, not the real Mark Zuckerberg yes. who loves to grill meats and you know, post dead eyed videos right. <laughs> like this. Like, it sounds like a Muppet. Is it like, like the world's most Mark terrifying? Zuckerberg, I'm like, thank fucking God, the social network. That's the only thing I'm cool in. Is yes, the social correct. network. Right. Remotely cool. This movie kind of makes him seem like a badass. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, God. Remember when he was going to run for president and then like two months later, it was like, eh, he's, he's not going to do that. <laughs> People aren't excited about me. <laughs> Um, uh, no, by, think, by being catching fire out there. I think what's interesting in a way that that makes sense, right, is like for both Sorkin and Fincher, there are aspects of Zuckerberg that they relate to too deeply and aspects of Zuckerberg that they are uh, repelled uh, by. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And they're different. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. They're both, I think, kind of in conflict about this guy. But their feelings don't overlap. But I think there's more going on beyond Zuckerberg, uh, re-Harvard, and yes. the culture that created Zuckerberg and his competitors at Harvard. And yes. I think that, I think a lot of Fincher's interests lie there. That's Sorkin's do too, but Sorkin is, you know, it, he writes about class in a you know pretty straightforward way. Right. You know, he gets the... Zuckerberg is aspiring to, you know, jump the ladder and, you know, get into these like well, yeah, no, Fincher rooms loves and all that technology, right? But Fincher, Fincher likes pushing through walls, right? But I think he's like this is like a haunted house as well. Well, we'll correct, but but Sorkin is a kind of a classicist, and also he is, if not a luddite, he is a luddite. He's fully a luddite, right? Yes. I mean, he, I think he's a self-professed Luddite. Yeah. And I think he kind of is one. Right. I, like, think I don't think he's putting it on. I think he's terrified by technology and also has disdain for it. It's not even like a this is not for me thing. I think he views it as something of a cultural ill. I think he understands. If I were Aaron Sorkin also, yes. I probably would really hate the internet because the internet really likes to talk about Aaron Sorkin. Like, you know, so I would get well, turned this off. Is, this like, Reddit thread was going around like it's, it, it, Sorkin's obsession with quote unquote great men, Right. Go ahead. I, I might want to stop talking about the Reddit thread I haven't read, but okay. No, no, I'm, I'm because I don't think Sorkin's obsessed with great men. But okay, go on. Well, this is the question, right? Or he doesn't think they're great. Yeah. But he does. There's nothing he loves more than a guy who is so smart mm -hmm. that no one else understands how smart he is, and gets to like sort of run these linguistic circles around everyone else, mm -hmm. and just fight to persist in his worldview, pushing through, right? I think the best Sorkin projects are the ones like 
I mean, it's it's what's so great about Moneyball is that the guy fails, right? We can talk about Moneyball. Wow. When are we going to talk? In about this movie, the guy succeeds, but I think Sorkin's a little terrified by the effects of what he's done. Whereas that's the exact thing that Fincher kind of likes about him. It's like this guy threw bricks through every fucking glass window. Hmm. You think so? I don't know, man. I don't know. We I, This is getting complicated just, for me. I'm, thre- right. I'm starting okay, to I'm, thread I'm going it. back to the dossier. All right. Because fin- I don't know if Fincher totally thinks that. I don't know. I have a lot to say about one thing on that. Right. Okay, we're gonna we're keep talking we'll about that. All right, Fincher's given the script on a Friday. Reads it on a Saturday. Monday, he goes to Amy Pascal. We need to make this movie immediately. Like yeah. we have to be in Cambridge in the fall. Yes, I want to like you know I feel like this is a strike when the iron is hot thing anyway because you know this story is unfolding, Changing so right? You right. know, so like yes. the, the quicker we make it, the better. It's a big challenge for him, I think, on two levels. One, it's a lot of boardrooms, mm-hmm. you know, and lawyer, you know, depositions and talkiest movie he's ever done. Right. Even like Zodiac, which is very talky, is but not. That's, that's a tense film with, yes. you know, a serial killer in it. Yeah. And so it's not, this is really dialogue based. It's dialogue film. based. And yeah. literally everyone in this movie is going to be okay. And by okay, I mean, we'll be a billionaire. Like yes. the people who get fucked over in this movie get fucked out of more billions, but they all end up at tens of billions. Yes. Like Saverin for basically. Let's be honest, if you want to be real about Edward Saverin doing fucking nothing and almost blowing Facebook. Now, maybe he should have blown Facebook because I could do without Facebook in our society. Yeah. But like he didn't do anything and he is worth $14 billion just because, of you know, he was Mark Zuckerberg's pal who gave him a thousand bucks. Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If you read about Edward Saverin, he's... He is, he is not a sympathetic figure, in my opinion. In this not movie, he's very side. sympathetic. Sure, yes. Well, that a lot right. of that's just yes. Garfield in um, the paint. The best. Yeah. Uh, Sorkin says, speaking to what you're saying, I have yeah. an enormous amount of empathy for Zuckerberg. Mm-hmm. I felt it was easy to do the Revenge of the Nerds version of this, yeah. but there's more something more compelling about his wanting to do it his way because he was right, like, regarding, like, you know advertising, you know, early on sure. shit like that. Like Zuckerberg is right about most things in the course of the, the movie, The Social Network. Like, yes. like his his mind for how to do this, even if he's ruthless yeah. and rude, like is is sort of like correct. Right. Um the ultimate communication tool needed to be devised by someone who doesn't have the best communication skills is how Fincher puts it. It's a great ironic notion. Uh, I'm not here to crucify Mark Zuckerberg. He accomplished an enormous amount. Um, but I know what it's like to be 21 years old and trying to direct a $60 million movie and sitting in a room full of grownups who think you're so cute, but they're not about to give you control of everything. So that's where he gets the Right, Fincher. that's the part that Fincher relates right, to. Right, I get yes. that. But yes. I also think Fincher is like a little bit He's like... A- terrified of him like you said but i'm saying they're both terrified of different aspects of him and both impressed by different aspects of him right right there, there was um uh, all the david Pryor sort of uh documentaries uh on the special features of this movie that are really good john david Pryor, empty man should we just do empty man maybe i'm like should we do that instead of mine hunter people are gonna hate hunter i just don't want to cover tv i, I don't either TV. you know what we're gonna have to take it to the fans and by take it to them, I mean, like, yeah. take it to them. <laughs> Yo, with the fucking baseball bat. Exactly. Hammers. Yes. Um, Should we just, we'll do a poll? Yeah. But I think, well, you never know with the Empty Man Hive, because they're everywhere. I know. Empty Men. Have you yeah. seen the Empty Man? No. There's not a lot going on inside. It Fs. Yeah. And by F, I mean it A pluses. Sure. Here's, yeah, yeah make it clear. This ain't no F <laughs> cinema score. Right, right. Because no one was in theaters. They didn't get to see it. Um, yeah. Uh. My the David Pryor, the wonderful David Pryor directed yeah. f- feature length documentary about the making of this movie that's on the DVD. My Very good. It's about doing Mindhunter, just they didn't direct the whole show and it's not like it's a mini series it. where we can knock the whole thing out. I agree. Yeah. Honestly, I kind of agree with you. Not to devalue it within his filmography and whatever. It fucks so hard. But that's sure. Like, yeah, absolutely. It does fuck hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe Ben and I just do a side project where yeah. we're like, it fucks so hard. Yeah, do a fucking Mindhunter watch along podcast. 
Oh, God. I'm sure there's like 50 of those already. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. And talk about striking while the iron's hot. The Now's thing, the time. Well, the thing with Mindhunter is, though, it's true crime, which no one really chats no about in the about. podcast You know, space. actually, I don't think anyone's been brave enough yet to talk about serial killers. <laughs> right. Well, no, here's the Crimes thing no that aren't done. true. B being a little funny while talking about true crime on a podcast, that's yeah. untouched. What I was going to say. Yes. Uh, there's an Eisenberg... Uh, uh, quote, I'll paraphrase here, but he was saying like the, the reason Zuckerberg was so effective at making this, this social network, right? This thing that basically rewrote the ways in which we interact with each other is because he thought about social interactions in such a binary way. Mm. He thinks about them like code. Mm -hmm. That the, like the whole creation of Facebook of being able to like, I'm going to click on the name of my favorite band and see everyone else who has listed this as one of their favorite bands, which changes the way we think about how we connect to people, is how he was thinking about other people. Well, Eduardo and I live in the same house. You know, we're part of the same, like, dormitory. We like the same band. We are friends. Right, it's like that. You know, he was already almost seeing the code of that right? as someone with no natural, like, ability to organically connect to other people. It's like, well, you look for the matching data sets. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I thought I that think was like a accurate. very yes. a, 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 a astute observation from Eisenberg. He's a smart guy. He's a very smart guy. Uh, and I mean, how old was he when he made this 26? movie? 26, okay. I believe. I mean, this is, I just, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about yeah, a lot more. You're right. yeah, 25, what a fucking 26. towering performance. It's the best. And a performance that kind of feels like for the 2010s on... Like the the seismic uh, shift of like fucking Pacino and De Niro landing with their antiheroes in the early seventies, you know. I completely agree. Where you're I like, mean, this is the first guy, the first performance, the first movie to fully crystallize a new kind of terrifying type of modern man, right? And um, they hit it so hard, and you just have so many people trying to replicate this performance in one space or another. And some people have gotten close, but this still just remains like, holy shit, did they nail it? I don't think he's had a bad career at all. No. And obviously, he's actually done a good job finding himself sort of blockbusters to be in yeah. and stuff like that. And, and, and making also made small projects, boosting films. a lot of uh, smaller filmmakers, first time filmmakers, foreign filmmakers. But I almost, I still w like kind of wish he had more. Totally. But I'm also just like, I I was thinking the same way. And then I looked at his filmography. And as you said, I don't think he's made bad choices. But then I step back and I go like, how does he top this? I, it's tough to do. Like, what do you, okay, what do you think his best post social network performance is? I really like the double. That That's my answer too. That's my he's answer. He's so good in that. Yeah. Uh, and like second best or whatever, you know, competitors might be like uh, uh, Art of Self-Defense, which I really like. Which he's fantastic in, a film I also love. He's very good in Louder Than Bombs, although that's kind of like a slight, like that movie isn't quite as sure. good as you want it to be. And then, I, but then, and then I'm like, yeah, well, he's good in Zombieland. He does what he's supposed to do. And like, now yeah. you see me. And but Zombieland's like, before this. Uh, oh, that's right. It is. Yeah, it's a year it before is. this. No, but what about Zombieland Double Tap? Well, he tapped it a second time after this. Uh, did Emma David, Stone die in that one or something? Like, how, how much time did she give that them? That was my thing. I was just like, she must be in it for the first five minutes. I think she's in the whole fucking thing. Yeah, apparently she is. Yeah. Well, good for her. Spoiler alert for Zombieland Double Tap. She lives? Yeah. <laughs> Feels like a spoiler. It does. <laughs> I was ready for that to be some Expendables 4 shit. Um, Sorry, uh, you mean ex no. ex Exfordables? Yes. Mm -hmm. Exfordables. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's interesting that like, uh, even Zack Snyder, right? I mean, if it, just half Heard second side tangent here, right? But like Zack Snyder offers, uh, uh, Jimmy Olsen to Jesse Eisenberg in the wake of this movie for BVS. Uh-huh. And the bit was going to be, well, obviously Jesse Eisenberg is Jimmy Olsen. That's great casting. And then I kill him. I shoot him square in the head. He's turned into mush. Yeah, fucking twist. <laughs> yeah, twist. And Jesse Eisenberg goes, I'd rather play Lex Luthor. And Snyder, to his credit, kind of readjusts and goes like, yeah, the modern day Lex Luthor would be Mark Zuckerberg. Would be Mark Zuckerberg. No, it's, it's I mean, it, yeah. I mean, that performance is 
is very big. Well, this is what I was going to say. And then Zuckerberg even realizes, like, what am I going to do? Just you do mean, Zuckerberg again? You mean... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Eisenberg, Eisenberg realizes. Yeah, right, yeah. I can't just straight up give the Zuckerberg performance again, even though that's probably what everyone wanted to see to a certain yes. degree. I think if he had given the Zuckerberg performance again in that movie, I'd, I'd probably like it more if he was toned down. I give him credit. He tried something different. Yes. It's just... Also, he doesn't have the best script in the universe no. uh, that he's uh, reading from there. It also feels like he chose to play uh, Max Landis more than he chose to play. American Ultra gets made before. This has always been my pet theory about that performance. It's a solid, solid theory. Thank you. I met him once. Uh, I did a panel with him at Sundance. He was incredibly nice. Like, Eisenberg? Like, yes, just yes. like unbelievably yeah. nice. And it was in that movie. He's in, I think I've talked about Wild Indian that he produced. Right. And is in right. one scene of. Yes. And I was like, why are you in one scene? He was like, I just figured I could help out. Yeah, help you know, me. like, yeah, you know, just no, being in the movie is total, sort of helpful. Total man. Yeah. Yeah. Seemed really nice. Yes. And like, once again, is a guy who has helped to get a lot of tricky movies off the ground. And he, please, Abraham, I'm not that man. Do you know what that, you know what I'm no. referring to? No. It was in, I believe, a New Yorker profile or. Oh, oh yes. Maybe Time Out. Yes. Uh, where they were like, hey, do other people like recognize? So obviously, he's really pre-social network, just to be clear, like Roger Dodger. Like, he's yeah. really zombie land. He's good in other stuff. Yes. Uh, he land, says, I get called my- Napoleon Dynamite because I have curly hair. I live in New York City and right. I ride a bicycle. I bike down Ninth Avenue. There's this kid who goes to school named Abraham. And every time I pass him, he calls me Napoleon Dynamite. He screams it out and his friends laugh. It's a fine movie and I wasn't in it. And the guy says, well, what do you say back? And he says, I say, please, Abraham, I'm not that man. Yes. <laughs> Imagine him saying that as he bikes. And then it gets replaced with the Michael Sarah thing, which I've always found a little confounding. But like... They have such different they styles. They do. They have different energies, but they they were Hollywood's nerds, premier yes. nerds of the 2000s, you know? But it's like Sarah's whole thing is like, this is this is the softest nerd. And he's also nothing like John Heater. I mean, these are all sort of odd totally. personality matches. Yeah. Anyway, Fincher and Sorkin. Sort of an odd union in a way. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Fincher's technical precision, very difficult, uh, uh, very different from Sorkin's whole play fast and loose. West Wing can go $50 million over budget. Who cares? Like, mm-hmm. you know, right? Sorkin had written, for example, that Mark would be drinking a screwdriver yes. during the uh, initial face mash scene. Right. I guess Sorkin just kind of thought like, that makes sense in my head for something he would drink. Well, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong here. Because there's been a lot of talk over the last 13 years since this movie came out about how much the Erica Albright character is a bit of a creation. She is, sure. Right, yes. that's a Sorkin sort of framing device, dramatic device. Yes. But... Th- there is a blog. Right. There's a real blog post about him creating Face Mash that is maybe not filled with invective towards, like, you know, but, like, is, like, a lot of... Obviously, a lot of that stuff Drunken is... Drunken wake of rejection. But, like, him talking right. about, like, all the technical language of, like, first I do this, you know, yes. like, that's obvious. It's not like Sorkin wrote that. Like, that's obviously right from the blog. Totally. And I... I there Like, there is ire directed at a woman in it, right? Uh, Am I wrong about I, that? I might have to check that. I'm my, not actually... My... Sure. my uh, double check this, but my understanding had always been that Sorkin sort of extrapolated from that, like, oh, I'm going to make this all about the one girl who rejected him that he never got over. Whereas it felt like it was perhaps a much smaller thing. I mean, the thing Zuckerberg has always said in his defense is like, he meets his wife very shortly after yeah, this. That, They're together for a very right, long time. I got to be clear with this. Please. There is nothing about a woman in okay. this blog. Okay, yes. fair now, enough. But the thing there is, yeah. is the next to pictures of farm animals yes. is in the blog. Yeah. The putting, you know, uh, and, but yeah, you can read the blog. It's almost entirely... Uh, verbatim in right. the movie. Okay. The, but not the stuff about the Erica's stuff like bra added. size okay. and shit like that. But how he hacks and pulls all, all that the, stuff. All but that also pictures. the stuff of like, oh, Billy had an idea of comparing like a ladies to farm animals. Like, and then right. maybe then we, you know, and then it's a lot of like the thing with like, though the Turing feel, yes. you know, and all that stuff. But Sorkin's thing was like, he was like, he should be drinking a screwdriver. And Fincher was like, he says he's drinking a Bex in the blog. So he's going to be drinking a Bex. Right. Like, we're going to be accurate here. Well, and it's like, it's such a great little microcosm of the difference between these two guys, right? Is that Sorkin's justification was, it, it, the way he's writing, it feels like he's more drunk. If he's just drinking a Bex, I don't think he gets drunk enough to talk about the sure, farm Sorkin's animal like shit. he needs to be drinking He needs something liquor, heavier. Right? Sure. Yeah. And I Fincher's mean, like, 
but he was drinking a Beck. And I think and Fincher he did post that. Right. Which means either I also it think says Fincher something is like, more interesting about it. That him. makes sense to me. A 19 year old college student drinking a Bex. Like the Fincher's just immediately like, that's how I see it. Like totally. that because it's real. Like But also, like that says something about him that he wasn't dead drunk. Yeah. And also, like, what kind of freak kid is like, let me pull myself a screwdriver? I was uh, you know, come on, who does that? Uh, David? Yes. I don't know if you've heard the bad news. What's up? Uh, Stomp is closing. Uh, yeah, I think it closed even on, in the East Village. Even worse news. I do have some good news, though. You know what replaced it is the uh, the Empire strips, strips back. It's, yes. Yes. The anyway. Star Wars themed burlesque show. Correct. Yeah. Anyway, bad news. Stomp is closed. Good news? Stamps is still running. That's true. Because Stamps, you know. Mm-hmm. With so much of our world digitized or automated, why would you stick to old school mailing and shipping when you've got Stamps.com that can do the hard part for you? In fact, they're pretty different business models. Stomp's business model was bang on some trash cans to the amusement of tourists. True. Right. And Stamp's business model is save you time that you would waste in line at the post office by allowing you to print U.S. postage at home. Make shipping easy. Look, it's a post office in your office. Yes. Postage rates just increased again. Stamps.com has the best discounts in the industry. Yeah. Amazing partnerships with USPS and UPS for unbeatable rates up to 84% off. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. Let's make this clear. It doesn't have to be a post office in your office. Uh, no, no. It but... can be a post office in your bathroom. This right. is the thing. Stamps.com sends you the stuff and then it's up to you. That's true. All you need is a computer and a printer. They yeah. send you the scale. Yeah. You have everything you need to get started. You could do it on the toilet if you want to. Okay. If you, you need can. It, okay. If you need a package pickup, you can okay. schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, they seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart. It's really easy. It's so easy. You could do it and do whatever you need to do in the bathroom at the same time. Avoid the hassle and get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code CHECK for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code CHECK. Fincher's, you know, obsessive, detail-oriented thing, right? You got to get it exactly how it was. I remember reading some piece about Zodiac when it came out, and they talked about him being a stickler about, like, what is the actual pen that Robert Graysmith would have used at his desk? Sure, right, right. right. right, right. What do you gain who by cares? tracking right. down the yeah, pen? Yeah, you're not going to see it. Yeah, who cares? And it's sort of like the Bex thing where he's like, I'm not even saying you're going to see it. I'm not even saying it in a method way to help Hall, but maybe there's some discovery you make by uh, holding the real pen that the guy made that somehow informs something. Right. If you just go like, oh, the shape of this means that you're writing like this instead of this. Um, in the same way that it's like there's something you gain from the character by it being a Bex because that was what he was drinking. I think so. Yeah. The other thing... Without trying to make some greater point out of it by like dramatizing it into something else. Other thing that I think is crucial to note is just that the script was 166 pages. Yes. Sony was like, the movie needs to be two hours long. This is way too long. Mm -hmm. And Fincher was like, you and me are going to sit down and read the script. This is my favorite story. Yeah. And he starts a stopwatch and he and Sorkin just read the script to each other, like at the pace Fincher imagines the dialogue going. Click hour 59. And he calls the studio and he's like, we don't need to change anything. We don't need to cut anything. Like this will be a two hour movie. And it is. Yes. It's a two hour hour movie. movie. Yeah. Um, And it feels perfectly paced, I would say. Yes. I mean, most things about this movie are pretty much perfect, I think. Yeah. Like, you know, technically. Yeah, so I... Uh, th- this script starts getting sent around. The movie gets set up and announced. When I am on the set filming, the off discussed, especially recently, but where are the guns are. Mm-hmm. I'm on a movie shoot with a bunch of people between the ages of 16 and 25. And that film came out the same year as The Social Network and had a similar successful... Uh, equally successful right. equally successful but we're filming the movie summer 2009 so this script hits and like every single person on set is like I'm just trying to get any fucking part in the social I think network anyone between the ages of like 20 and 26 yes. read for this movie basically yeah. I just, yes. you know imagine you are uh, uh, a an, an actor trying to get your foot in the door right get noticed mm-hmm. make your name this script lands in your fucking email inbox 
because there's so many young parts for it. And they're like, maybe they'll cast a couple names, but they're going to, they're casting a wide net. They're seeing a lot of people and there are a lot of roles. And basically all of them are good. Even the people who only have four lines of dialogue, they're four lines written by Sorkin. Everyone who reads the script goes like, holy fucking shit. Because you're also reading dog shit all no, the time. No, absolutely. It's an exciting script. Right. And his scripts read really well. Yes. Like, when you read a Sorkin script, you're kind of like, how could this be bad? Totally. That's like, you read this and you're like, and this is so actable. Like, I remember reading the Studio 60 script and you were like, yeah. this is gold. It's tough. I'm not joking. You got to fucking master this language. As Jeff Daniels said, you need to learn so well you can dance on it. You love, you love As Jeff quote. Daniels said. I, I pointedly remember that the, they sent the script out, but for the auditions, it was just other Sorkin scenes. Right. Because I think, as Fincher puts it, basically we needed to see that people could do the pace more right. than anything. Like, is that, and when they saw Eisenberg's tape, he self-taped, yes. it was the first time, Fincher says, it was the first time I said, we're going to be under two hours. Like, yeah. this this is what we need. I think I did a, a, a Pulse and Perry scene from Studio 60, but I also know there was a West Wing scene and you could, like, pick which one you did. Um, did you play Paulson or Perry, though? I played Paulson. What do you mean, of course? I was defending Crazy Christians. No, Crazy fuck, Christians. that's the wrong position. Uh, she doesn't want it on the earth. His she, well, well, she's defending the actual crazy Christian. She's defending that, that sketch dares skewer. Excuse me. She's defending sane, reasonable Christian. Of course, you're right. Um, but yes, everyone reads the script and loses their fucking mind. Studio right? He's hosted by uh, Rob Reiner that week. The in script 2005. is 2005. The, the script is really long. Six, maybe. Oh. Yeah. The script is long, really long. long. I remember in the lead up to this movie coming out, reading that, uh, you know, uh, anecdote. Mm -hmm. about them reading the movie with a stopwatch. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's so funny, and I clocked it again rewatching last night, that the dialogue on this movie basically starts the second the studio logo start. Yes. As if they're like, we have no time to waste. Right, right, right. The, if we're going to stay on Mara pace, we have to just Zuckerberg like... talking yeah. over, and there's the, you know, the music, the uh, ball and biscuit, white stripes, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Uh, Eisenberg's approach to Zuckerberg, as he says, I think he's trying to run this organization and keeps having to deal with people who feel like they deserve something because they've always gotten their way. Uh, I felt my character was in the right. There's no other way to act it, which is totally, you know, a good call. Here's another thing to mention about the Eisenberg casting. Uh, this movie gets announced. People are like, oh, you know, Jesse Eisenberg would be good as Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. Sure. He starts Roger getting Dodger, like fan cast shortlisted a, short right. a lot. He looks like him a little bit. Sure. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, Fincher, Fincher has said in interviews, like, I hate when people tell me who to cast. Right. Especially the public. Everyone online starts telling me this is who you should hire. So I almost go into it resentful when I'm finally watching his tape. But like, I'm going to fucking cast someone else just because I don't want to pick the person you're telling me to pick. And then as you said, he sees the tape and it's just like, God damn it, you assholes. Undeniable, he's the pick. Right. He's the one guy who can deliver this at the speed we want, the intensity we want, the energy, all that stuff. Now, Garfield, who's already up and coming, but obviously 2010 is his big year. But Mark Boy, Romanek... Hey. That's that's his, his launch at British yes. TV film, basically. He's very good in and the and the Red Riding trilogy. Um, yeah. but but Mark Romanek Moran had already worked with him for Never Let Me Go, mm -hmm. which comes out the same year, puts him in front of Fincher. Fincher is into it. Garfield never meets Saverin. That's not surprising, obviously. Sony had already done Zombie Land, which comes out after this film, yes. but before Social Network is a movie. So they're he is someone who's probably, you know, okay by them. He's on their good list. Um, Sony wanted Jonah Hill to play Sean Parker, pushed for him really hard, wow. even though Fincher was like, I'm interested in this uh, this performer you may have heard of named Justin Timberlake, yeah. who I think will pop. It's just weird to think that Sony was like, Timberlake, get him out of here. You know, like, I don't Maybe they just, well, I mean, Jonah Hill was certainly a big name at the moment. Huge, yeah. And I guess maybe Sony is like, oh, he'll overwhelm the picture. Or, oh, he, you know, he doesn't know how to act. Or, I don't know. Timberlake? Tim, Justin Timberlake, yes. Yeah, I think also they're just like, if we have Jonah Hill in this, we have security that the movie will be funny, right? I think they, see that, yeah. they, they want, I, th I could understand there being a little worry on Sony's part of like, is Fincher going to make this thing so fucking heavy? Is he going to make it so like, dark? Had he brought sexy back yet? He had brought, he brought sexy, sexy back. So maybe brought that sexy was back. part of maybe what they were weighing in. They were nervous. But like, and what goes around had come around. Right. Yeah. yeah, but like Dick in a Box had happened. Like, it's not like Justin Timberlake had not been part of funny things. And of obviously that's not. the funniest thing that's that like, ever the happened. The Sorkin script the reads the funny. The yeah. Sorkin script mm -hmm. reads funny. Fincher had not made anything close to being this much of a comedy outright. You know, as much as obviously Fight Club is is deeply satirical, you know? 
Yeah. I could see them being like, put one person in who is kind of a conventional comedic actor. But Tim Blake's like, uh, sorry, Fincher's like, no, and I want, I mean, Hill is actually a closer read for the real Sean Parker. Yes. Tim Blake's like, this needs to be a fantasy, like when he yeah. enters, you know, and I kind of want this guy to feel like a star within his world. It is like, what is smart about the casting is that you're casting Eisenberg and Garfield, who are movie star versions of dorks. So they need to be impressed by a guy who in the real world was sort of a movie star version of a dork. But in a world where movie stars are playing dorks, needs to be played by a pop star. Mm -hmm. You need to like adjust everything on a curve around it being a movie. I think there was just the feeling of like, yes, does Timberlake overwhelm it? Mm -hmm. He had been in a couple movies at this point. In bed. The audiences had not accepted it. He had been in the love guru and shit, right? There'd been a little bit of a push to put him in movies. At this point, he'd already sort of receded. They're like, he hosts SNL and he's a pop star. That's his thing. And then it's funny how quickly after this movie, everyone's like, he's a movie star. We're forcing this into happening. Because Friends with Benefits is the next year. And people and basically time, yeah. reject this. Yeah. They do. He's. I think he's absolutely incredible in this movie. And I don't I really think he's been particularly good he's, in anything else except for Inside Lewin Davis, he, which he's like, you know, good in. He's but only like, good it's a smaller when role. great directors use him. Well, you know, ain't that, ain't that how it totally. goes? Totally. Um, but yes, no, Sony does About Time and... Uh, yeah, because I well, I love him in Southland Tales, right? That's, it's no, it's in time, really right? In time, yes, that's but the Southland after. Tales part of the earlier the movie career isn't sticking run. It is, but it's also like it's obviously just like his big moment in that is he sings a song, like so. Anyway, in time, I mean, he lip syncs, but in time and Friends with Benefits are both Sony. It's like Pascal yeah. watches this movie early and it's like, you know what? I'm wrong. Look, Justin Timberlake, we're all in. He's not actually that bad in Friends with Benefits. People stick up for that movie. I think it's pretty bad. Pa Pascal basically sees the dailies from this movie and is like, Rooney Mara's Lisbeth Salander, <laughs> Andrew Garfield is Spider-Man, we're making three Timberlake pictures. Like, people gave her credit. Most I think of those bets fairly. were solid. Yes, right. Yeah, of yeah, just yeah, being yeah. like, you know what? Fincher nailed. Obviously, Fincher is part of the Lisbeth decision yeah. as well. Yeah, Kept yeah, making yeah. more movies with Eisenberg. Was just like, he picked a couple really big fucking stars early. And then Dakota Johnson gets plucked to her own thing. A hundred percent. Her own franchise. Her own franchise. And yep. don't forget, um, a great performance from uh, Caleb Landry Jones. He's Did you the, catch him? He's in the frat house. Ben? No, I didn't. He's at the Coke party. He's at the Coke get party. Busted. Oh, uh, really? And you know who I truly love in this movie, and we probably won't talk about again, is Joe Mazzello as I, Dustin Moskovitz. He's so good. He's so funny. Yes. Which is all he's required to be. Yeah. And also Dustin Moskovitz to me is the perfect example of like that guy. I'm not saying he's not a successful skilled person. I'm sure he yeah. is. But it's like why is he one of the richest men on earth? He was just Zuckerberg's roommate. Yeah. He was just right just there. Did. And his vibe for the whole movie is just like happy to be here guys. <laughs> like uh, whatever. Under, <laughs> understated <laughs> aspect of, of so what good. makes Mazzello so good in this is He's arguably, and it's it's because this is what that role requires, right? For that exact reason that he's just some dude. He's maybe the only person in the movie who does the Sorkin dialogue, but makes it sound like it isn't dialogue. He's really good at it. Right? Because everyone else is playing the patter, the rhythms, you know? And he's just kind of throwing everything off. Because mm -hmm. you're like, this guy doesn't have the energy of, I'm doing something important here. I'm someone who people are going to be studying forever. Some other people in this film. Army Hammer uh -huh. uh, is in this is film. He? he plays the Winklevoss twins. Yeah, he played two characters in this um, film. He obviously. Did, oh, he did both. Josh yes. Pence plays the body of one Winklevoss. Uh, yeah. Yes, you're, who you split a split a credit with. In, uh, you're, you're, you, right. It's you and him on in draft day. I forgot that it's me. I think about that a lot. Yeah. Um, maybe there's a third person in there too. I can't remember. I think it's just the two of you though. I think that's right. Uh, um, he uh, it, Honestly, maybe one of the most impressive things Fincher has ever done technically. To yeah. this day, you're like, well, Army, there's actually two Army Hammers. Like it never, ever feels weird to me. No? I, I, I look, I don't want to, I don't want to pull rank here. Okay. I watched my 4K Blu-ray of this, which is currently only available in the Columbia Classics. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's the volume two or Whatever. the volume three set. Yep. The sets that you've been opting out of because you don't like how big the box is. Don't like how big they are. But they keep on not putting them out as individual yeah. releases. How much bigger of a box are we talking? It's wide. Do you think it looks bad in 4K? Because I haven't seen it in 4K. No, I think there are a couple shots uh -huh. 
especially the ones where he has to move a lot. Sure. Where I did feel a little bit of of the sort of um, deep fake tracking Never spatially. Sure. In like dialogue scenes, it works fine. He's incredible in this movie. And it's one of those performances for me with a lot of these canceled celebrities where I'm like, I'm so used to this performance because yes. I watched it so many times pre-cancellation yes. that for some reason it's siloed away from me. <laughs> and But if I then I watched Death on the Nile yeah. right around the same time I watched this. And you're like, whoa, whoa, get him out of here. Ooh. Spoiler alert. He's also he, awful in that movie. He does end up being a bit of an army hammer, his character in that movie, right? Yeah, yes, he's bad. I mean, yes. every, everyone in Death on the Nile. Right. The whole point of those Poirot mysteries is at the end, Poirot is like, you are all terrible. Yes. I am the only good one. Goodbye. Let me stroke my two mustaches. <laughs> uh, um, um, it's just funny that he's, he's uh, his great crime in this movie is being kind of an annoying piece of shit, the character. The wing both of them. sure yeah. yes right they, rather sure, than being a, well i have a lot to say about their characters a criminal like oh, sure. like in well, death on an isle or oh or, sure right they don't commit right. any crimes in this movie right yeah. right yeah. and yet this is the performance where you're just kind of like well it's actually all the weird army hammer stuff almost kind of boosts this it's, yeah i mean yeah yeah he's yeah. pleased no playing he's incredibly good in this. yeah yeah uh rooney mara uh incredible find obviously yes. um yeah, I think just without her performance, this movie is lesser. Uh, you know, like if there yeah. was, if someone was just kind of like average in the Erica Albright role, yeah, that would feel like really corny. I, I put this disc on. I watched it. Her face is so amazing. It's yeah, it's all like her eyes, like you yes. know, like and how quickly you can tell like his words are hurting her, and like you yeah. know, like go ahead what are you, what are you? no I, I I put the disc in I watched this opening scene it starts the credit sequence I'm like you know what I'm gonna fucking restart the movie I just wanted to watch the scene twice it's in a, a row great scene. I mean it's great it's yeah. very very you know I mean look I remember seeing this oh and also of course we have to shout out Max Minghella my favorite Max Minghella moment mm -hmm. by far the fall one of the greatest yeah, falls. it's an incredible I mean, thing so it's incredible and pratfall. I said it's to so Forky good. and Forky's seen this movie like once before sure. I've seen this movie like 50 times yeah, same. I was just like honestly one of the best Pratt Falls coming yeah. up and she she was just like what what do you mean this is like, the, the, there's nothing about that scene that suggests Pratt Fall no. incoming <laughs> It's so good. No, and you also think about it being Fincher that he probably had to do that fault 150 times. I would love to know, Max. Please Makes tell it me. all the more impressive. Um, I remember, so I saw this film, Griffin. Uh, this film up in the New York Film Festival, yep. you know, and then went on to an Oscar run. But I saw it at BAM. Have you heard of it? I have. Brooklyn Academy of Music. Yes. With my girlfriend at the time. Bam Rose Cinema. Humble brand. Correct. And uh, my roommate, our roommate, uh, Andy Scott. Shout out, Andy. Andy doesn't get shouted out enough on this podcast. Learned Foot gets his... Learned gets his His flowers. moments in the sun. Yeah, but... Uh, but Andy Scott, we love him. Mm -hmm. um, also met him on <laughs> OscarWatch.com. Okay. Wow. Uh, yep. And I just remember, obviously, that first scene, you're kind of like, whoa, you know, like, you know, the dial. You're like, fuck, right, Aaron Sorkin. Because Aaron Sorkin hadn't written a movie in years when this comes out, right? Yes. This is kind of the start of like Studio 60 bombed. He's all right. He's moving off TV for a minute, right? Is this like, his first movie since American President? It's his first. No, there's Charlie Wilson's War. Right. Okay. Which everyone yes. just kind of agreed to not yes. think about too hard. That's the only other one in between American yeah. President yeah, and that's this. Yeah, that's well. That's well. And obviously he had stuff like Farnsworth Invention where you were yep. like, when's that coming out? Yeah, I mean... First scene's incredible. No, I'm just that we were all like, whoa, shit. Mm -hmm. But then it's the Mark jogging through the Harvard campus. The score comes on yeah. where you're like, I, no one told me this was the vibe. Yeah. Like, I was not... I know the trailers were very cool and moody. Yeah. But no one told me this was the vibe. That Like, I, I felt like a monster was about to jump out from behind a corner. I remember talking to a friend about how good the trailer for this movie was, which is one of the all-time great trailers. Do you mean the the initial the Creep initial Creep trailer, Scala yes. and right. Kolchansky brothers, um, and saying like it looks like like Breakfast Club meets Zodiac, right, right. And my but friend then was the whole like, time you were also kind of like, but how is that going to work? Totally. And who cares about a Facebook? Movie, no, and really, right? and re well, I had read the script, so I knew how fucking good the script was, and right. I was like a year of people being like, I don't want to see a fucking Facebook movie, and I'm like, you don't understand how good this thing is, right? But even still, it was like, I don't totally see. And I'm so in the tank for Fincher at this point. Sure. But it's like, it isn't an obvious fit. Nothing about this no. sounded good on paper. No. And so I say to my friend, like, it's like Zodiac meets Breakfast Club. 
And my friend was Good like, call. where are you getting the Zodiac from in that trailer? Right. And I went, well, David Fincher directed. And went, David Fincher directed the Facebook movie? He did. Did you know that? He actually directed the social network. He did. Yeah. Um, but that trailer has this sort of creepy vibes of opening with that song mm -hmm. and the super zoomed in, pixelated, clicking through Cut profiles color. thing yeah, 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 in yeah. this way that feels voyeuristic, right? But I guess me and other people who hadn't read the script were like, is the movie going to be about like using <laughs> right, Facebook? Because yes. if so, that sounds bad. Yes. No, what's fascinating about that trailer is that it's it's like 30 seconds of this zoomed in Facebook usage, right? Over this very haunting piece of music. Um, it feels like what would be a teaser trailer that ends with one line of dialogue or one shot. And instead, it's that for 30 seconds, and then they give you the full trailer, basically. Which is such an interesting tone setting thing in the same way that this opening credit sequence is of just being like, there, there's something kind of unsettling happening here. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in opposition to something like 21, where it's like a fun story about a fucking, a bunch of rebels. These kids stuck it to the they system. could do this bullshit. Right. It's this thing that Fincher's tapped into of like, there's something really kind of unsettling at the psychological core of this thing when you really dig into it, right? Yeah. And uh, watching all this, like the behind the scenes stuff, they had three weeks of rehearsal with the script and the full cast, right? And there's so much... It's a fucking drinking game whenever I say right. Um, there's like three weeks of rehearsal table work with Sorkin, with Fincher, and with the main cast. Mm. And Eisenberg says, I maybe spoke for a grand total of 15 minutes across those three weeks. Okay. Now, he's the guy who has most of the dialogue in the script. And he went, I realized this wasn't as much about Fincher trying to do blocking, get the line readings down, time all that up, because he's going to do 100 takes on set. Right. It's not like he's waiting for them to be first take perfect, you know, trying to prep it in advance. That was all him trying to nail the story down. Hmm. He didn't say that to us. And then you're watching these cutaways of Fincher just going through line by line with a fine tooth comb and going, Aaron, come on, that's too cutesy. Right, sure. You don't need to repeat that four times. Right. When you say it like this, it feels like too much of a that. Why I wish they had collaborated again. Because I yes. do think he's a great, you know, moderating force. Like, no one else is going to give Sorkin notes like this. Sure. I don't think Sorkin takes notes from anyone else like this. Well, he probably doesn't anymore. There may have been a point where he might have, but yeah. Fincher's being gentle with him, but also is so resolute in what he's saying. You, it's not like he's trying to, like, fucking sledgehammer him. No, but you can also see in that documentary like how interested Sorkin is by the whole process of making movies and how excited yes. he is to be on a set. And I think it's it's fresher for him then than it would be, you know, whatever, by the time a, a certain trial was taking place of some guys from Chicago, for example. In all this footage of the back and forth of them pushing on these things, there's a really interesting telling piece of Sorkin saying, but do you think if we lose that, this character is still, like, relatable? Uh -huh. Is the audience still rooting for him if we lose this? Okay. And Fitch was like, I, what do you mean? And he says something like, I mean, I just think I'm rooting for this guy more if I understand it's because his heart was broken rather than because he's trying to become rich or successful or whatever it is. And Sorkin, I think, thinks... Well, that's the emotional in I need is I need to create this er Erica Albrecht character, right? Mm -hmm. I need there to be this person who broke him in this whole thing. And especially like we're ending on him, refresh, sending her refresh, the friend refresh, request. Refresh, yeah. refresh, refresh, refresh. He thinks of that almost as like an emotional sweetness of like, that's how you redeem this character for the audience. If you ground it in a real emotional rejection, I think Sorkin is framing it in that way. Maybe. Here's this guy who would come off as like off-putting if you didn't add this thing. Whereas I think uh, Fincher sees that as like, this is the creation of a monster, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this moment of rejection curdles him into something. It's almost though the difference of like between someone who's never used Facebook and someone who has, because right. to me, the ending, yes. you're like, this is so creepy yes. and eerie and like a thing totally. uh, that people engage in right, right. Uh, with the obsession it's obviously not that like this fictional woman is responsible for turning him into an asshole right as she calls out he already is one you know but 
it, it is that his response to this is so bad that it sets him on this path that to some degree destroys human society right, as we know right. it. And I think that cutting to from that sequence, which is so much fun to watch, right, is this like amazing fucking screwball patter between two young actors who are just like ready to fucking bite in the material this good. Yeah, and just the Sorkin thing of like, you have to be aware that one of them might be replying to a question that was asked a minute ago and they've she already moved on to another topic. Line where she says like, Sometimes I don't know which thing you want me to respond to. Dating you is like dating a Stairmaster. Yeah. Yes. But in a lot of Sorkin projects, the lead male and female characters have this kind of banter. But the unspoken part is much like, you know, a Barbara Stanwyck character, a Rosalind Russell character. Uh-huh. Even when they're fighting, they both find kind of find it charming, right? Even when like Harriet is, is yeah, 100%. furious it's, at it's Matt flirting. Alby. It's It's sexual chemistry. It's Yeah, of right. course. Yeah. The precision, the sort of, um, the tuning of Rooney Mara's performance into, like, she's genuinely just so annoyed at this point. She can keep up with him. Right. She can fucking do the Sorkin dialogue with him. But, like, this is not fun. He's even, impossible. Even He's before annoying. the moment she decides, I need to end this, it's just like, what, are, what the fuck are we doing here? And then when you cut to the credit sequence, and as you said, the music kicks in and you're just like, whoa, this is a different vibe than I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. That's Fincher setting the tone of just like, there's something really ominous happening here. There's something really dark happening inside the soul of this guy and it is now just going to spread. Right. Um, And it's going to be forged in this place that is, you know, like Harvard. Yeah. That is kind of like terrible like you know like that that, like it will just state this kind of like brooding insecure evil you know like this like toxic like like dynamic of like i have to be the best and i have to you know be a cutthroat and then he goes home and he writes a nasty blog post uh and he creates a nasty little website you know to make people feel bad about themselves like it's like the sort of most blunt force version of facebook right it's like the drunken mean version of facebook i'm not going to uh uh put them on blast by name but i remember a couple years after this movie coming out uh reading an interview with an actor who was promoting a different movie who was still angry about the fact that he had not gotten cast as mark zuckerberg in this film Wait, who is it? I will tell you. Come off on, mic. I will tell you offline. Fine. Uh, you can also bleep it. I mean, I, I, I you're not even going to know who it is without looking him up. Kiefer Sutherland. That's why I was like, it's really weird for you to grind this axe here. It was Kiefer Sutherland. God damn it! But his big gripe was like, you watch footage of the real Zuckerberg. I spent like hours, days studying him, getting the voice right. Eisenberg's not even doing Zuckerberg, right? And even the adding of, like, Erica, you know, all the things in this movie that are fictionalized, this sort of version of Zuckerberg they create. I think of this movie like the way that fucking Shakespeare wrote tragedies about, like, you know, world leaders. Sure. Who, like, self-destructed. Okay. Right? These people who had all this power to move nations and shift the tectonic plates of society. Okay. And just, like, collapsed in on themselves. And that's the thing that I think uh, this opening credit sequence gets across and that's then carried through the rest of the movie is like, this is a guy who's now emboldened with the need to like reshape the world in his image. And they are using him as a dramatic construct, basically, taking a lot from real events and real transcripts of what he said. But it's like, it's the idea of, and this is what I think this movie gets at so well, of like, this is the moment when the rules of humanity are rewritten. It's a thing that I think Black Hat is kind of about, a movie we've discussed in the past, which is Michael Mann going like, Wait, not my Blu-ray. I spent my whole, they keep delaying it, but it's because the director's cut's being included. I approve and I I can't wait. I approve. It's being a second disc, it's not 4K, but it's because Elements not being available. It's fine, I don't care. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. 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 I've approved the shipping delay many times. Target asks for you to approve the release date change or else it cancels your order. Black Hat, I think, is a movie about Michael Mann realizing that the guys he spent his entire career writing about cops and criminals no longer are the people who are the badasses who get to intimidate the world. Sure. Right? Sure. If everything is on a computer system... Yeah, yeah, no, I get you. Then the guy behind the the computer 
has to be Chris Hemsworth. And also, someone's going to stab you, tie a phone book, uh, cool. phone book to your chest. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th- this is a moment where, like, not only, well, obviously, the guys who write the code, they create the inventions, they become billionaires, they become the richest men in the world. Zuckerberg starts to actually rewrite the fabric of how we interact with each other. The, I know he's not the person to create social he, media. No, he's not. And also, I, he's not entirely doing it because out of malice, he, well, he's not doing it out of malice at all, yes. really. But like you say, he looks at the world in a certain way, at least within the world of this movie. Right. And he makes a thing that makes us look at the world through that viewpoint, maybe even though we don't feel that way. Or, like, But that's the frame that I think that's so smart that that Fincher is, and, and Sorkin are putting around it, which is like, you have to place some intentionality into it for dramatic sake. Right. But like... But here's the actual, like, takeaway, much like if you're trying to write about Julius Caesar, it's like, but what's, what can we actually infer from what happened and who the guy was? Well, let's, uh, let's not get into Shakespeare. You're going you're gonna to get me on so many rants. So I'm like uh, Erica right now. I don't know which thing I'm supposed to respond to. There's a reason we have no guests Look, on, on Facebook, episode. though, I did create a, a, a group that was praising a particular sandwich you could get at the my university's, like, you know, okay. sandwich counter, the chicken and bacon sandwich. Sounds cool. But yeah, we all had a great time on it. So I think Facebook worked out for the best. I made a Facebook group, a Facebook group called I'm Really Fucking Pale. Sure. That, that was good. mostly to have a reason to talk to the uh, other, uh, the pale girls in my high school that I had a crush on. Absolutely. And it got really big in Australia. <laughs> That's, look, we can't do, it was like 20 people from my high school. when Facebook was interesting. And then like 10,000 people from Australia. But it is, that whenever I watch this movie, I cannot help but remember those sort of two to three years. It's really yeah. that. It's not much longer than Basically that. Basically when it was still just college students. So, well, the first initial phase where it was just your college, where it actually was cool. Yeah. Like, yeah. and then the next wave where it was still like, well, we all use Facebook. But before like the news feed had come in and it was sort of like, it was still fine. It was still I, invite. I went on a vacation. Yep. Should I post the pictures on my wall? And now like the idea of posting anything on Facebook sends a deadly chill up my spine. Like imagine if I posted on Facebook. Well, I'm pretty sure what Facebook is mostly just laser content. <laughs> that there's laser? satellites in the sky that shoot lasers down. Into your head? I got into a whole conversation recently with a local business owner where they were telling me that the Hawaiian fires were caused by invisible lasers, but that invisible lasers are the strongest form of lasers and that there's all different kinds. There's purple lasers, there's blue lasers. It was all color-based. But invisible is the hottest, most dangerous type of laser. What sort of business was this, Ben? It actually, weirdly enough, was like a like a craft store. Well, there you go. Yeah. I, Facebook for me is, is basically just like my aunt and then like three people whose pages I shouldn't look at, but they're so strange that I click on them. So Facebook is clearly like, oh, is that your friend? We'll show you everything they say. And I'm like, oh God, also get someone, them away from me. Also someone with a lot of twine on their hands. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, it took me a second to get there. Good, good. Good. Thank you. All right. See, All you're right. city kids, though, whereas I, as someone who grew up in the suburbs, I feel like Facebook is also a place for ants, but also for people from high school. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't have whereas too much of that. you have, like, cool friends. Although I did, are, well, no, no, let's not go crazy. That, no, that's like, well, I, I, uh, <laughs> I deactivated my my Facebook profile several years oh, ago, yeah, same. and I've started a, a fake account that I use only to sync up my Disney Emoji Blitz a game across multiple <laughs> devices. The, the last thing that's like synced to your Facebook is Disney Emoji Blitz. It's a new account I created just to do that. Uh, f- fair enough. And then there are like three private groups I join where I want to gawk at what people are saying uh, in adjacent social groups. But but like, look at how we fucking bring it up, and immediately we're like, well. I was able to make a group about the fucking sandwich that I liked. Here's a lightning rod that connects me to other people in my community. I remember getting into fucking college because I think Facebook really yes. starts to grow you in would, between my sophomore and junior to year. I go to college in 2007. I joined Facebook, I think, in 2005. It was either five or six. And that's when it was like, oh, this is a college only thing. Wait, I heard a couple high school people have gotten on. If I got it in 2006. If I your high school it. gives you your own email domain and you have a referral from someone else, you can get onto Facebook. So it was either 05 or 06 I get on. By 2007, I'm looking up everyone else who is going to the college that I've chosen 
in every program, comparing their interests against my own, like pre-picking who my friends are going to be. Um, I all I look don't use. I just I mostly just tried to. I don't know. Chat with girls. But this that's the whole I fucking point. Too. Yeah, that's I, what the movie gets. <laughs> I just yeah. and and but like I think we are obviously the last generation that will have any memory of the feeling that this movie is very much about mm -hmm. a Facebook being something exclusive. Yes. Something you want that maybe your friends, you have friends who have it and you don't have it yet. I, I had, you know, like already done friendster in my space at this point. The I, novelty. I never did either. Right. I, yeah. See, I did both. I was hard in both. I only did my space. I didn't do friends. I was I so, so into friendster. But like, yeah, the novelty was not there with Facebook, but the exclusivity immediately made me want it more. The yeah. fact that it was like, my older friends have this and I can't get on. It also had a good aesthetic. It had a clean presentation. It, 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 it at the time looked cool. Yeah. yeah. And you look at those pages as you see them in the movie, you're like, right, yeah, Facebook didn't used to be like cluttered by bullshit. Well, no, like, you talk about the things that Zuckerberg was right about. Both Friendster and MySpace basically became unusable within so a year cool. or two. Right. Friendster would always crash. And then MySpace just got like so bogged down with ads, with artist pages, with spam, you know? And the internet wasn't fast enough back then. These pages right. take forever to load. Oh, right. Like, sure. These are all mistakes that Zuckerberg and others saw where it's just like, no, it needs to be clean and simple. So like it loads fast. It's an understated aspect that just for those first couple of years, Facebook crashed so much less than these other sites. Totally. That they basically drove themselves into the ground because they couldn't keep up with the demand. But, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, uh, Facebook, um, as this movie portrays, mm -hmm. went to Oxford and Cambridge first and LSE. And I had friends at Oxford and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge. Sure. I got waitlisted at Cambridge. Yes. Um, and Same. so I had to wait. Yep. Mm -hmm. I had to wait. Which college? Uh, the smart one. Good. Uh, <laughs> I had to wait an additional like seven months yeah. or whatever. Yes. And but then my friends would be like, oh, yeah, I did this on Facebook. And I would be like, Sounds cool, you know. Yeah, anyway. Amazing to think about any of this now because, of course, Facebook is is uh, bad. But all of this felt... Like, bad for society, but it's also just bad to use. All of this feels... Uh, it felt novel at the time where it's like, oh, I've unfolded some new tools on my Swiss Army knife of how to interact with other people, right? Rather than being like, this has basically become the dominant model of how people interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. That's what's know. fascinating to think about is like their pitch on this in the movie, which is so much how it was received by us, people at the exact ages to be in the crosshairs of the Facebook phenomenon. Right. As it was like emerging. Um, was like, and here's like it, all these bonuses, right? Here are these like extra limbs you can gain in your ability to interact with other people in the world. Yeah. Bad. But basically, people, this character, right? This like absolutely antisocial, uh, uh, sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, I, I, there's a bunch of behind the scenes stuff where Fincher just keeps on reminding him. This scene has the four things uh, Eisenberg when he's like directing mm -hmm. Eisenberg in scenes. Yeah. He's like, I want to remind you the four things you're terrified by in this scene: physical proximity, <laughs> eye contact. He's directly confronting you. Sure, it's like they created like a bullet point. List. Like the, these are your triggers. Right. Yeah. And basically saying, like, in this scene, he's doing six of the ten. Right. 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 That's interesting. Here's a guy who like doesn't know how to interact God, with Fincher's other so people. Interesting. Yes. In in actual life. And his defensive posture, as is often the case with people like this, is to just play smarter, right? Yeah. To be a Sorkin character, to act like an asshole, or at least try to seem like an asshole, because that's the only way for someone who feels that weak and uncomfortable existing in a real room with other people to gain any sort of illusion of social capital. And instead, it's just like, well, what if I just change what the rules of socialization are? In the film, what happens? Zuckerberg is insulted, uh, broken up with, goes to his dorm, creates face mash, gets in trouble, uh, gets academic probation, and this catches the attention of the Winklevoss twins who ask him to make a social network site for them based on the exclusivity of the Harvard email address. 
And that clearly sparked something in Zuckerberg's brain where he's like, why don't I take my Facebook hacking skills and that idea to make Facebook? I know we're seven minutes into the movie. I want to say two more things about the credit sequence. Uh, to say them quickly, please. The score, which is obviously incredible. The score is amazing. No, no, but the, the thing of the the basic sort of piano melody. Ding. Doo, doo. Right, where you're just like, well, that sounds like loneliness. Doo, doo, doo. And right, then, that's the thing that married with Reznor going, what feels like the ambient noise from a slasher film. Yeah, is such a good encapsulation of the whole tension of this movie. Right, if you've never seen this film in a theater and you ever get the chance, it sounds incredible. Incredible on a movie theater sound system. Uh, the the him going across campus. Rather than it being any complicated, like, super long tracking shot, the kind of thing that someone might think Fincher would attempt to do in a long, wordless sequence like this, is instead a bunch of largely stationary shots. Sometimes the camera shifts in to find him or it shifts out when he leaves or whatever. But almost all of these shots are big, wide shots of campuses with a bunch of people around them, people socializing. He's alone, looking uncomfortable, rushing to get home as quickly as he can. All this space between the bar where he's now been left and humiliated and his, the dorm safety room. of his dorm room yep. feels like it physically hurts him. Right. Right? And almost all of these shots, the shot starts before he enters into it and they cut out of it after he's left the frame. And it's like he's struggling to get I like that. through all of this as quickly as possible. The second we get into the dorm room, you're in tight on him. He's at the computer. He's surrounded by friends, but they're out of focus. Yes, they're it's out like of this focus. This guy but needs also the safety. He's back in his fucking cocoon. But it also just feels like once he has his laptop open, he can communicate in a That's different what I'm way. Yeah, all that stuff. All of a sudden, it's like his life is focused up again, and he's comfortable and he's safe. The music starts to become cool. It's in his favor. You're cross cutting it with this party where it's like, well, these are the guys who yep. define what's cool at the school he goes to cool maybe certainly the, the, these this is the upper crust you know the the much desired a guy crust. like him society. the, the porcelain right. all that all this fucking freak you go to harvard. i turn to my wife and i say our daughter is never allowed to go to harvard and she's like neither princeton and i'm like mm -hmm, yale's off dartmouth no you know I was, and then we were like would we would we let her go to any ivy we're basically like cutting my daughter's opportunities off we're just like she can't be near these people a guy like zuckerberg the character right you imagine bides his time through high school and goes, these people don't fucking get me. And then I'm going to go to college where my intelligence is respected, where I have capital, right? And you get there and it's like, no, these Ivy League fuckers, these legacy dudes, right? These golden gods still are above me in the chain. And it's tradition and it's this idea, the rumors. I hear they bust people into these parties, all the theatricality, the pomp and circumstance, the speech this fucking guy's giving on the staircase, right? But in real time, as he does this blog post, as he writes this first website, the Face Smash website, he's like, he's shifting the power over to himself in real time to the point where people are stepping out of the party and over to their computer screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's somewhat unbelievable in a way. But I guess I looked at my computer a lot back then. I don't know. You know, the, the idea of things spreading that virally without a social network yes. does seem kind of crazy. And like in this movie, it's like, oh, I got an email, you know, like or whatever. I, yeah. But it, yeah, it was a thing, I guess. They're compressing the timeline a bit, I'm sure. But also like it did happen. It was a thing. It was certainly a, a notice, notice thing. Noticed yeah. thing. Um. Okay, but yes, the Winklevi just, you know, are intrigued. The Winklevi and Divya Narendra. Mm -hmm. Nar 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 Is that how you say his name? Nar Narendra, yes. Um, and, and yeah, right. But like, you know, that's the, the, the fundamental thing that the Fincher and Sorkin are interested by, right? Is like they, having the idea of trying to replicate the exclusivity that was so naked at Harvard. Right in the social clubs and all, and, and just in the fact that, like, masters of the universe kits go well, she there. she hates, you know. which he's, you know... Yeah, but he also, like, Spiraling about to, to Erica. Yes. Right? They rogue crew. They embody everything that he's kind of resentful of, that he doesn't have, that he can't access. And here they are pitching him a site that is just trying to reassert their innate value based on well, it's, their birthright, where they went to reasserting the value, but it's also just creating a porcelain online, like yes. creating their club online. 
Right. Where it's like, yeah, only the best of the best get to be in here. And like, you know, they're having this conversation with him the in the bike the room yes. where he can't go any further. They're giving him the sandwich like it's some kind of, you know, oh, lucky you. You got yeah. a Phoenix Club sandwich. Or, they're you know. so close minded, though. They Whereas are, but they're also just. Mark is like, I can see this bigger well, Way bigger Mark picture. understands, right? Yes, he he immediately understands like the wider implications, like better than they do. Yes. Um. But what I love about the Winklevosses, who are sort of like they certainly in the movie, you're like, I get they do undeniably get screwed over, mm-hmm. right? Like, but those guys have been fucking dining out on. That's the why the movie is so yes. successful. Yes. I mean, look. Well, I don't know how, how sequentially we're proceeding here. Because, like, the crux of the movie is the Summers, is the Larry Summers scene, which yep. Zuckerberg's not even in. Yes. Um, but we can get to that, I guess. But, uh, yes, they they definitely see Zuckerberg as, like, a little uh, worker man that they can bring in to do, to, you know, activate their great ideas. H- Hammer's delivery, the moment where he, because, you know, Zuckerberg says, like, this is MySpace, friends, or what are you pitching to me? Sure. And they go, it's the exclusivity. Harvard.edu. Harvard. Yes, right. So, right? Yep. And there's there's an arrogance to which he delivers that as if it's like the fucking mic drop moment. But this is undeniable. Like right. he, he Zuckerberg completely gets it. And it's this like Harvard Masters of the Universe mentality, as you said, of these guys being like, we need to exert our um, superiority in everything we do in our lives, Right. The way it's obviously the joke of people who go to Harvard, how many times they're going to mention that they went to Harvard, right? Sure. And the boys club and the connection and all this sort of shit, right? It's like they also now are trying to extend that onto the internet. They want to make sure that everyone knows that they are superior on the internet. But it's upholding a pre-existing system Mm -hmm. versus Zuckerberg immediately seeing that and being like, well, wait a second. If they're going to hire me to make their website to perpetuate their thing, the tradition that I cannot break through, why wouldn't I instead do this for myself and make a new system in which I establish what the social strata is? Yeah. Social network. Yeah, Facebook. Take another drink. The Facebook.com. The Facebook. Well, I have one note on that. Drop the dots cleaner. So obviously, as this movie is proceeding, we are being interrupted by the depositions. This, you know, yes. clever screenplay style where like we were, you know, we the audience are in the momentum of things are being created. Two lawsuits like, simultaneously. Eduardo Saverin, your friend in this movie, yes. is now suing you. Yes. Stop. The Winklevosses and Divya Narendra are suing you, and Eduardo's there too. You yes. know, as a as a witness. Like, well, no, that's the empty chair. Well, he he no, but remember, he's sitting. Oh, oh you're right. You're right. He yes. empties the yes. chair after yes. his testimony. Yes. Yes. I mean, which yes. is a great, yes, great moment. Yeah. Um, but right, and so you're like wisely the movie's just like you know just fyi so you know as you probably do Mm -hmm. like this is all going to end in like legal bickering because we're just watching kids talk in college but like billions are at stake also the smart framework of this movie of like often these stories that uh are being made the film's being made so shortly after the real life events it's like well how do you end your movie if we're still existing in the timeline of this thing if we don't have perfect perspective on it. And it's like, that's that's the loop here. The mm-hmm. loop is the creation of this thing through to these two lawsuits, uh, everyone arguing who gets the credits, yes. the glory, or the at money. Least a piece of the pie, right. Right, yeah, and yeah. what happens from this point, who knows? But like, this is the difficult birth process of this weird thing that we now live with. It gives you a good end point to know where your stories. Yeah, no, it's clever. Gonna stop. Clever construction, I mean, yes. obviously. And so many of the iconic lines of this completely iconic screenplay are in deposition scenes, you know? And uh, I remember certain... Now I'm so used to this movie. But, like, I definitely remember at the time, like, the first time I saw it being kind of, like, thrown, like, you know, by cutting to all the... Like, how, how am I supposed to be keeping track of this? Like, how much of this movie is evidence that I need to reference back every time we're cutting back to the boardrooms? Then, of course, you watch the whole movie and you realize, like, of course... None of this really matters. He will settle with all of these people. It's meaningless. But you could classify this movie as a legal drama, which I think is fascinating. You could. Yeah. Sort yeah, sure. Right. Why not? But um it's a legal drama in a very contemporary way of like, yeah, all of these 
things get settled behind closed doors with right. NDAs signed and money given over and like and it the doesn't matter for because Zeta Jones going like just fucking pay them it doesn't matter well she's not even saying that's my advice she's saying like FYI that is happening you're one of the right. worst witnesses I've ever seen right. in deposition you come off as so arrogant this and is mean. a parking ticket to you and and right and also right you move have on with your life. hundreds of billions of dollars it doesn't Settle matter with them. move on yeah. uh, which is what happened obviously yeah and that should make this movie feel like it has no stakes. Because as I said, every single person in this movie got so much money. Yes. And they got so much money often for what amounted to like a semester in college. Like yeah. of like, oh yeah, sure. Great. You know, I'll help. Doop, doop, doop. You know, I'll yeah. write some code for you or I'll give you a little seed money or something. So like everyone's fine. Yeah. Quote unquote. But it, it, it you feel the dread and like the horror. And also you are so attached to Mark and Eduardo in this movie, like to their friendship. And like, we can briefly mention like this movie is like an iconic film in Tumblr slash fiction culture. Sure. Like, like so, so huge for like people, you know, sort of inventing like romance and like deep, you know, connection, like, you know, just like off I mean, of the chemistry of these two actors. Garfield, one of the most innately empathetic actors of his his Generation. eyes are always shimmering. His yeah. voice always sounds like it's cracking. Yes. Yeah. Um, his introduction, we watched the whole sort of like face smash coding intercut with party. Wardo shows up. Don't you think you'll get well, in he trouble? He comes in at the end of that sequence, right? Well, but he's saying like, when do you want to stop doing this? So like, we've, we've watched the whole like hand covered bruise. Mm -hmm. Hand covers bruise is such a fucking good name for that track yep. too. Yeah, it is. Um, but we've watched that whole walk. And then at the end of this, like, big sort of uh, uh, coding sequence, the triumph of the thing getting uploaded, you cut out to Eduardo arriving at the dorms. Mm -hmm. And he's dressed like a grown-up. Mm -hmm. Which was apparently the real Eduardo Severin's vibe. He totally. wore suits to college. Right. The guy looks good. Yeah, and there's Garfield. this tiny Garfield movie good star moment guy. where he takes out his badge that he has to swipe, and he, like does it to the side, almost in like a little bit of a Gene Kelly move, not sure. to overstate it. Okay. But just immediately from behind, you're like, this guy's got a little more finesse than any of the dudes I just saw upstairs. And he comes upstairs, and the first thing he asks is, Mark, are you okay? Yeah, right. He's. I heard yeah. it. So it's also, here's heard the first you guy to, up with Erica. Yeah. He's like actually emotionally caring for him. Yeah, he and is. Zuckerberg's in this movie, like, he is. How do you know? How do you hear about that? Right. Your blog. You're blogging about it as we speak. Right. And yes. he goes, well, do you see about the website? Because I'm not asking, like, the, the, Erica, no, but then even as they then switch to the website, Wardo is the one being like, this is going to get you in trouble. When, when Maybe we call it a night. Like, also, you know, I have the algorithm. I'll write it on the... So he can't right. help himself, right. It's just such efficient characterization of, like, first just in movement, in, in visuals, this guy is cooler than these other guys. While still being a nerd, he has a little something... <laughs> That Zuckerberg can't even fake. Well, but he, that's why Zuckerberg uses him, I think, both in real life and in this movie. It's like he has a foot in each world. He's empathetic. He's a nerd. He actually knows how to emotionally connect to people or at least try. Yep. And also he does, like, carry his own weight in this world. Even if he's within this group seen as a little bit more of the businessman, a little bit more of the grown up. Yeah. But he, you know. He... It's not like he's a dilettante. Yeah, well, he actually kind of was, I think. But yeah, within this movie, I'm talking when I'm talking about. I know, and I'm putting all these names. The in The question it's in the, the characters movie, in the movie, but the question in the movie, I think, is yes, of course, Zuckerberg and and Eduardo. I think the algorithm on the window is important. It is, yeah, yeah, because he uses it to make face mesh. That's what yes. you mean, right? Um, no, I think I do think but they're that, genuinely that friends. Something, but yes. then like one of the most quietly brutal little moments of course is they've been working on Facebook together Eduardo gives them a little money they make this thing yeah and then he's like it's ready to go give me the emails of everyone yes in the Porcelain or the Phoenix Club or whatever it is you know in your club and like that is Zuckerberg's like he's not wrong though like that's who that will just send it to them and it spreads from there like yeah. you know that is the algorithmic way of thinking about this yes but it feels callous and suddenly it feels like, oh, he's just, is he just friends with Eduardo, like, for this? Like, Much like he's going to, he's going to brush off the Winklevi until they mention that they row crew. Right. And now that lit something in him, you know? He's having fun with this as, like, a project until Eduardo mentions 
that he got punched by the Porcellian. Yeah. Or by like, the Phoenix. I mean, it's the, one. It's the Phoenix. I yeah. was, you know, who fucking, I can't. And then that, that immediately goal. makes him go, let's step outside. I want to go bigger with this. Mm. It's like every time he gets some sort of reminder of the things in the conversation with Erica, it like lights a fire in his belly to be like, we have to go 10% harder. The party scene where Wardo goes, yeah, he's got the hat it's on. It's like another little movie star moment it of is. like Garfield's undeniable and he just makes Eduardo a guy who's just a little bit cool. I was doing his little shimmy there, to be clear. It's a good shimmy. Um, it's such a tough supporting actor year. It's it is not wild surprising that he didn't he, get it. But, but you were just complaining about this with another movie. Matt Damon True Grit. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just like a really tough five. Jeffrey Rush is the weak one and it's like that's an Oscar winner giving a very big emotional performance in the Best Picture winner. Yeah. Like, and then Christian Bale, you're sort of like, eh, quasi-lead, I guess. Like, yeah. No, but, but uh, yeah. It's a really tough five. Yeah. And Ruffalo getting his first nom. Yeah, which was overdue at that point, but but now, in retrospect, I'd, I'd throw that to Garfield or Damon. Now that I mean, I might Ruffalo too, got his other noms. I think Ruffalo's... Yeah. Like, I think he's very so good, in that. good in that movie. But my my feeling at right, the time was just like, thank God we're finally nominating him for something. I certainly have... Garfield and Damon in my five. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, no, and neither Ruffalo nor Jeffrey Rush. Who are your other three? Uh, Jeremy Renner in The Town, who was nominated. Mm -hmm. uh, John Hawks in Winter's Bone, who was nominated. Uh -huh. And of course, Ken Watanabe in Inception. One of my favorite performances ever. Of course. If How you want to be an old man filled with regret, yes. waiting to die alone, bought the airline, it seemed cleaner. Mm -hmm. Um, you can keep it on if you want me no, to. No, please. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. So, uh, Wardo and Zuck. Yeah. I mean, I think they just thread the perfect needle of like, I do believe they have some genuine connection. Yes. But obviously they met in college. So it's not like they were longtime friends. No. And, and I, there is a transactional element to it, which is like, it's like said, fucking Harvard. That's all it is, especially yes. these Harvard un undergrads. It's like, well, how can you get me somewhere? You know, like, who do you know? And who do I know? And right. Like sure. a lot of that is probably just always floating in the air there. Yeah. Except for. Uh, Joe Mazzello, who's just like, hey, baby, I'm just sitting here for the but ride. By, by casting Garfield, he's going to give a performance where you innately believe that he cares about this guy to some degree. To some degree. Yeah, he does care. He feels bad. There are the little Sorkin-y moments and that's right. such Sorkin shit. Yes. Much like that moment in Chicago 7 where, what is it? It's like Abby Hoffman is like, oh, I read your speeches. To, yeah. you, know, you know, like shit like that. You know, like, I defended you about the chicken. Like, you know, with, right. you know, like those little moments. Zuckerberg may be using Eduardo, you know, so befriending him strategically, but you also can't deny it. This guy's nicer to him than anyone else. Because he seems kind of... In, in, yeah. He doesn't have a ton of options. Yeah. Yeah. He is I by mean, default his best friend. Mm-hmm. I am I'm eating a sour patch kid. I one sour patch kid. One little one little kid. Green? Green. Best one. I might agree. Wow. I might agree with you on that. Well. Ben? I like green. Wow. But I like blue too. Mm. See, now that's that's controversial. That's, that's right. I feel like that's a bolder take. Yeah, we'll save that for the dragon tattoo episode. We don't have room <laughs> for that in this episode. We can all agree on green. Blue talk will happen in the next one. God, I can't wait for that episode. Um Okay, so what happens next in the film? Um, at what point? As you said, there's this going back and forth of uh, uh, Miguel's character clocking. How do they first find out again that he started this site? Um, well, it starts to go around, and Miguel is, uh, you know, Divya is at oh, the. Oh, um, yes, the, when he does uh, the fall. That's what I'm saying. You know, he's at this like a what His is called acapella laptop. performance or yes. whatever. Yes. He sees it. He's like, holy shit. He goes to the Winklevosses. And it's one of my all the Winklevoss stuff to me is just so crucial. Yeah. To this movie telling a story about how like success and you know, capitalism mm -hmm. worked in America and was changing. Where uh it's the I forget which is which, but you know, one of the Winklevi is slightly nicer than the other one. Like right. one of them is a little harder edged. And it's the I think it's Tyler might be the nice one who's like, well, we don't sue people. We're gentlemen of Harvard. That that whole thing, the like, whole men of Harvard attitude is like. And Divya has the really he's like, you thought he was the only one who was going to think that was stupid. Yeah, 
So but, this guy doesn't understand the rules have already changed. But like that but these right. entire systems that they have bought into that they think give them capital in the world. Which are, which have given them capital. Of course. To be clear. And they are obviously tremendously wealthy people. But are like eroding in rapid time. Right. But just like I love that idea that he's like, it's low class yes. to sue someone. That is yeah. not what we do. Right. Like that is obnoxious. That is stooping to his level or whatever. Right. We'll, of course, just triumph because we're the best. Like our product will be better. Like what we're offering, you know, our faces, our, you know, whole affect is better. But, but in a world where everything is run off of computers, the people who know how to write the code that computers use basically have the ability to rewrite reality. And also, I mean, Divya is obviously really smart and just being like, he got there first. Like, we are, that's it. We're fucked. Done. Like, we can't just like launch the same website and be like, but ours, you know, is by six foot four guys who wrote crew. Like, he know? doesn't care about any of the shit you're fucking talking about. And he doesn't have to win anyone over in the court of public opinion because everyone wants to be on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. He did it. He did it. It's done. It's and over. also like, for as much as the Winklevog, you know, sued Zuckerberg and got a settlement because maybe he, you know, like, whatever, borrowed elements of their idea. Right, they got a pitiful, paltry $50 million each, no, whatever the fuck. Way more than that. Oh, that's what they got publicly, right. Um, but, um, you know, uh, like, they eventually made a website and it was shitty. Like, I think it, it was sucked. like, it was like genuinely shitty. Yeah. And Facebook was obviously... It was called Connect You. It was called Connect You. Yeah. It makes me think of Connect Four. I'm out. I'm not playing a board game no, here. I, I go Trying back to, to the Eisenberg thing of like, they were overthinking it. Yeah, right. You needed a guy who already thought about social relationships like they were code. Um, but obviously, they still think they're playing by different rules and they have this whole revelation of like, well, the Harvard fucking student book yeah. says you can't steal from students. So, Ben... There are rules that we all uh, agree to. Larry Summer, the president of Harvard, this scene. That is so good. Yeah. The actor in this scene is a man named Douglas Urbanski. Doug Urbanski. Okay. Who is Gary Oldman's producing partner and not an actor. Not an actor. He's his producing partner, I believe, also his manager. Yes. He's like um, his business partner, I should say. Yeah. Because he, he was like a theater producer. I don't know how Oldman... I, honestly, I don't links know. ...links up with him originally... But they start working together on Nil by Mouth, which is the movie Gary Oldman directed. Yeah, but which is like, I mean, Douglas Urbanski is like a guy from Jersey, New Jersey. Totally. Oh. And like Nil by Mouth is like this like harrowing tale of like life and, you know, the, no. the projects in London. Like yes. it's like, you know, I, really, I, really. I was trying to dig into it and I could not find how yeah. they got linked up. But basically from that moment on, they're joined by the hip. He's his business manager. He's producer on a lot of his films. Okay. He is not an actor. No. Uh, he was a frequent guest of Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, he's he's a right winger, or at least he used to be. I've no, you know, like a very Rush Limbaugh-y right winger, like sort of yes. loud and obnoxious in that way. I don't know. I mean, obviously, Fincher eventually worked with Oldman and really admires Oldman. Also, Fincher and Oldman share an ex-wife. They sure do. Uh, the mother of Fincher's yes, they daughter. Do. They do, undeniably. Right. And, I still, and they had been... Their projects they talked about doing, they're obviously guys who existed in, you know, adjacent spheres for a long time. I still don't really know what the story is of Fincher being like, you know who'd be great to play Summers. It's what which I is a scene where you could bring in a heavyweight actor. Absolutely. Because like it makes sense. This is a this Larry Summers was Secretary of Ed, Treasury. Yes. He was a celebrity in this world. Like so it would be fine if you had fucking Name and you know John Lithgow or whatever. So in a movie, show up for one scene. Where almost like all of your fun. characters are under twenty five, you could be like, well, here's a good opportunity to get an established August character actor, a friendly face, right? Someone just fucking nailing it. Um, and yet this performance is transfixing. Urbanski says, "Okay, I found an interview here. You know, I hate to admit this, but David may have seen a vague physical resemblance." He says, "I didn't study Larry Summers for the role because I quote, I couldn't be less interested in Larry Summers." Talk to a couple people, you know. Right. Um, Larry Summers has hair. Douglas Urbanski does not. Mm -hmm. So the resemblance is not that strong. Sure. Like, I think they both are kind of stocky guys. That's about, uh -huh. uh, and sort of similar age range. But like, I don't really know. You know, he's not really, because Urbanski is probably like kind of too, you know, inside Hollywood to be like, oh, you know, this is how it happened. He's just like, I don't know. Fincher wanted me to do it. So I did it. You know, it's fine. He's amazing in this movie. 
He's amazing, but you, not that I recommend the same one, but you dig into his uh, uh, interviews on uh, extremist right-wing outlets, right, in the 90s and early 2000s. And there's something to the way in which he talks about, like, these, these idiots, they don't get it, you know? That feels like a straight line to this performance. There's some brilliance, though, to Fincher being like, is any actor, regardless of how good he is for a one-scene part, going to nail this better than getting the guy who just exudes this energy? Right. Right? I mean... And he's got, like, he's got a great speaking voice. He does. He's so funny in this scene. I watched this scene monthly. I watch this it's scene incredible. all the time. And there's something to the fact, I think, in terms of him being a non-actor, where he has the energy of... Obviously, the characters, can we get this over with? I don't want to be in this fucking meeting. But, like, written in that great Sorkin way of, like, and you're here, and they start to, you know, do some, you know, exposition. He's like, I understand why you're here. Why are you here? They keep doing it. He's like, I know that. Why are you here? And then you finally realize that he's trying to get through to them. Like, how did you make it in here? Right. How did this bullshit reach my desk? I'm in charge of Harvard. I'm not in charge of like, you know, some tiny little liberal arts college where like, sure, I have to mediate between a thousand students total. This is Harvard University. But Urbanski, it's a very large organization. Urbanski, the person I think genuinely is exuding. Can we get this over with? I, I'm not an actor. I'm, I, Gary's on the phone. He right. wants two extra points on the contender. Right. The We're spending Ron three era. days on a fucking <laughs> three page scene. He's demanding a character poster for the Book of Eli and I think he deserves it. Yes, these are the kinds of things that Douglas Urbanski is no, you're right. he, he genuinely feels right? like he wants to be out of the scene, which is perfect for the scene. That's the thing. It's that he, his his complete disinterest in making a meal out of this role versus any actor, regardless of how comfortable they were in the reputation, would be like, this is a fucking good scene. I can nail this. Urbanski's like, I don't know why he asked me to do this. I'm just going to get this over And with. Summers' vibe in the scene is just like, you, it is offensive to me that you have made it this far, clearly through some fucking connection that your dad has with the university or whatever. Right. Let's point out, too, they're identical twins who pack. dress alike. I mean, and are, that's why, it's absurd. It's but just that's absurd. Why, they're I mean, the same again, person. It's I'm sure great Sorkin line. is reading. Yeah. Well, I'm 6'5", 220. There's two of me. And also the karate kid yeah, joke. Of we like, don't want to look like we're in skeleton outfit. It's true. It's chasing so, the karate kid. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure Sorkin cracks the book and he's like, wait, you're telling me that yes. this little reedy Jewish nerd. Yes. Like who's a computer dork was being sued by fucking Olympic rowers yes. who are identical twins? Two, like, golden gods. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> right. And they invest so much stock into this idea of Harvard and what it represents and what it will translate into for the rest of their lives, right? This, this like, badge they will proudly wear on their chest forever. They go into, like, the highest office of Harvard. And, and this like, kind God of bless like, them, they truly think that he's going to be like, you're totally right. Of course. I've just checked the handbook Harvard and law. you're right. Yeah, you're right. And he's like, I don't fucking care. I have a business to run. <laughs> that that like, line he has not... where he's like, Harvard students are so interested in inventing jobs rather than just going right. and getting one. Like, like he's like, very interested in Harvard as a business. He doesn't right. care about the fucking mythology that, like, the magic of what Harvard represents in the minds of little this wasps 500 everywhere. 500-year institution. Right. And, like, also, like, I mean, anyone I know who's actually gone to Harvard as an undergraduate, which these kids were, mm -hmm. is always kind of like, it's fucking Harvard. Like, the, the graduate schools are so important yes. that that's where everyone's attention is. Like, at a high, like the undergrads, it's just kind of like, yeah, what well, you were best of, you know, at your school, fine. Go do your work. We don't want, we're not interested in you, yeah. you know, and like, then you'll go figure your shit out. But this out. era is so unsufferable for guys like Eduardo and Mark and, and uh, Moskowitz and everyone who, like, worked their way into this school by, like, actually, you know... Well, Eduardo was rich. They're, they're, Eduardo was... I'm, yeah. not saying, I'm not saying they couldn't afford it, right? But it's, like, they had to, like, in high school, create shit that actually was of value. Right, Eduardo's fucking doing futures bets based on meteorology. Right. and they Zuckerberg, had parents to pay the tuition. Zuckerberg created a fucking algorithm that he, you know, Microsoft wanted to buy, you know, when he was a teenager right. or shit and, like and that. And to repeat my point... They show up here and they're like, well, here I'm going to be valued. And it's still guys like fucking this. And it makes them want to tear the whole fucking thing down. Collateral damage, be damned. It's just, I just think it's so funny to watch them realize in that scene, because that's yeah. the scene, that's the end of them right. really having a shot at beating Zuckerberg. Because then they go gloves off and they're way too late at that point. Right. But it's just like, it's over. Yes. We lost. We thought the rules worked the way they are supposed to work for people like us. Yes. And this, I'm saying this is a Jewish guy, crafty little Jew, 
<laughs> has fucking outfoxed us. Yes. And like, despite having no personality, being unlikable yes. in the pages of the Harvard Crimson, a, like, a, you know, like a, a violent lack of personality, literally like launching his reputation on doing like something like horribly sexist, yes. like and attracting like genuine criticism from like women's groups. Like yeah. if he, my, Forky said this and I had to agree with this. She was like, if he did that today, he would get like kicked out of Harvard. Like if you like yeah. did some like, weird sexist invective on the internet and then created like lady ranking site, like, you know, that wouldn't it just be like oh, slap be on national, the wrist? International yeah, it would be like, news. get out of here. Right. Yeah, it'd be in international news. In Madagascar, they'd be like, he did what? Yeah, Alex. Alex. The lion. Marty the zebra. Don't know the name of the character. Melvin the giraffe. King Bruno. Um, so that scene is just so crucial, he I think, to move too. it. Move it. Mm -hmm. That scene's funny. That's who's reading the news in Madagascar. Da, the da, penguins. Da, 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 circus. Da, 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 Rico. Da, 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 Afro. Circus. Kowalski. Afro, circus. I think Gloria's the hippo going, you invoked it. I mean, I invoked the name of the country, man, I guess. Which happens to share a name with a franchise. <laughs> Have you ever talked about the different chronologies happening? We've talked yes. about it on this podcast multiple times. I don't the think I've ever mentioned that I've it. Never I don't think I've ever mentioned movie. it. Um, so that I'd remember is, if I'd talked about it. That is the end of the Winklevi, in a way. Like, yes, as you say, then they try to kind of go gloves off. Doesn't work. They There's the regatta scene, yes. which we, you know, should obviously mention. Um, but like their certainly their challenge to Zuckerberg is blunted once Summers shuts them yeah. down. Yeah. Yes. No, they think great. Now we'll mount a full scale legal attack. They they have this uh match. What do you what do you call a rowing match? Uh, it's it's uh it's a race. I mean a race. It's a race. They lose. Painfully close. This was the Olympic qualifying event. Is that right? No, that, it's the it's the Royal Regatta at Henley. Okay. It's like a really big uh rowing event. Yeah. That happens every year in March in uh, on the Thames, the River Thames, if you know sure. it, uh, yeah. in London. But they're at this fucking... That's like a, that is an event for aristocrats. Right. Like, you know, I've never been to the Royal Regatta, but I know that if you're going there, you're going to have to wear a fucking straw boater or like right. a fascinator they're at this fucking or country club, like whiskey and cigar room, fucking sports blazer. With all the uh, shit that Harvard... Chap, you're so close. I mean, so Harvard close. is only pretending, much like all the American Ivies, to be that old. And then right. when you go to England, it's like, this shit is that old. This shit yes. is a... Th We've been doing this shit for a thousand fucking years. Yes. And it was aristocrats then, and it's aristocrats now. And they they already know that they're, like, they fucked up, right? They're too late yeah. now. There's only so much gain they can recover. Right. That's where, they, of course, they hear that it's spread to Oxford. And, and then they're like, we're, we're 40 times more fucked than we thought we were. And also the fact that this fucking guy is impressed by Facebook. Right, right, right. right the, the Prince Albert of dad. Monaco, or yeah, it's Prince Albert of Monaco. Oh, it is Jesus, because that's, that's the joke. Yeah. He said, you know, Divya is like, don't, or one of them says, like, don't worry, he, his country is like the size of Nantucket. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, funny. right. right. Um, but like already, they're they're obsessed with the failure they just experienced, which everyone is sort of like patting them on the back. In pity, you know? Uh, good, good try. Next time you'll get right, them. Right, very good. Oh, very close. By the way, have you heard about this? It's a website. <laughs> the Facebook. Yes. Dot C-O-M. Not sure what that means. Um, it's yes. so glorious. Go as, ahead. As oh, the, like as their, the their brutal yes, failure. to see it yeah. all oh, just sort of really stack on top. Um, so but I, then you also are like, yeah, but then I'm not rooting for Mark Zuckerberg. Well, that's what's so good about this movie is you're always kind of like, I'm not even sure where am I supposed to be putting my loyalties? And it's sort of with Eduardo because, like you say, he's sort of the emotional he's center the of the movie. He's the heart of the movie, but, but, I, but Zuckerberg then, like, is the protagonist. He is, but then also, as you watch this movie, especially now, you're like, wait, did he really just like not, he just like went back to school, like he went to his internship, like what was he doing? Like it's like they're they're so he was playing the old game right exactly he's the, he's doing another version of playing the like well you have to that's do this the path that. that's right, the track yeah. he was like selling ads yeah we're gonna get some ads right yeah. which once again we're is the most to. it's like something that personally hurts Mark it's not as much in my read that he's like that stupid strategically well he he does think it's super strategically he does yes, which it was obviously but I think he's also like how could you value that old system. Versus Why are you what you are me? and I are making. Right. You and I are fighting against the world. Sure. And you want to be with them. You still want their approval. It's another version of wanting to get into the club. But right? then, like, I mean, the, the, the split happens because Mark... Punched by the Phoenix. 
Well, the, well, that's part of it. Well, that's already happened, obviously. You know, no, but I'm saying it's an extension of him wanting the internship. There's some enmity of, yeah, of Mark being like, Mark both maybe desiring that path and right, uh, yes. resenting it, the, the traditional path that Eduardo's going on. But um, He wants to tear it down. Well, partly out of... He wants to be part of it as well, though. You know, like... Because that's yep. why he's saying, like, we need to expand to the most elite universities and to Stanford and to, you know, like, all that stuff. But then they meet Sean Parker. And Sean Parker, uh, of course, we meet Sean Parker in a wonderful scene featuring Dakota Johnson that might be the funniest scene in the movie just because of when Sean Parker says, like, there's a snake in here and she has to come out of the shower. Biggest star in the movie comes in, like, an hour in. Mm -hmm. I think he's at the 55-minute mark. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, he sees Facebook. He's like, I want to meet this guy. And in Sean Parker... As then this is true to life. I think Zuckerberg is meeting someone who like has that vibe of like we yes. need to we're tearing it down. I don't listen to what they tell me. Like big businesses come after me. Fuck them. Who cares? Like sure, I don't make money. It doesn't matter. Like I'm cool. I can go to restaurants. Everyone knows me. Like all this shit. I have models hanging off my arms. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, he's kind of actually. He's really like the proto Mark Zuckerberg. Yes. Yes. In his That's hundred percent what he is. But also kind of predicting that mentality yeah of of like getting all these vc investors yes. and just uh, and creating these products and having this braggadocious nature about but, but you also his line where he's like napster didn't fail it changed the music industry forever right, right? and now you're watching and you're like you ruined everything parker let me well, that's at the you thing. he he made no money off of it right right yeah it like was beaten into the ground but his victory is, I destroyed something. I destroyed an institution. I destroyed the way things used to work. No one can say that's a failure. I broke a corner of the world forever. Which he's right about. But that's exactly who Mark wants to be. Uh, it, I will say it is the one thing in this movie, and I always bump on it a tiny bit, and perhaps I'm just being so fucking petty about this. It is the only thing in this movie where I feel in the script... Uh, Sorkin's lack of knowledge of any of these people or the things that they created uh -huh. is when Dakota Johnson knows him. Sean Parker's the founder of Napster. Yeah, I just think for all of us growing up, Sean Fanning was the guy where it's like he's the Zuckerberg, he's the guy who coded Napster, and Sean this, Parker you're, you're was petty. his Eduardo. Yeah, sure, but you are being petty. I just think until Facebook, Sean Parker was not the known of the two. Uh, Even if he gained a lot of reputation in Silicon Valley and yeah, all of but that. Yeah, where are where are they? Silicon Valley. Exactly. That's that's the only reason it doesn't matter to me. Because I don't think her character would know it, but it's my only gripe of that like kind in this movie. You just have to movie. forgive it as screenwriting it. and also David, I, 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 I think accept this film's it. a perfect masterpiece. If if this it's was my Oxford only. University and someone knew who Sean Parker was, I'd be like, there's no way anyone knew who Sean Parker was. I would was arrest and, like, this movie. If it, <laughs> you'd arrest it. I'd arrest under it. arrest. But in Stanford, I'm like, eh, she probably might know who that is. Um, so yes, uh, yeah, he is. Uh, to he my is, point though, I'll say, since this movie's come out, I feel like uh, Sean Fanning exists in no one's memory. Everyone just credits Sean Parker with everything connected to I mean, it's now. because, you know, Parker knew how to yes. market himself, yes. obviously, in a way. Um, but it's also, yeah, because Fanning never really, he never really made anything else no. that like took off, whereas Parker, you know, is very crucial to the launch of Facebook. Every time they tried to relaunch Napster as a new paid premium service, Sean Fanning would like come by and be like, hello, it's me, the mayor of Napster. Napster, Jesus. Um, but like, cat? yeah, no, I remember it all, man. Fucking downloading, what are, you know, Sugar Babes albums or whatever. Anyway, like Sean Parker. Sugar Babies? Sugar Babes. Shout out Sugar Babes. If anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Great British pop band. I think the green Sugar Babes is the best one. I know Ben likes the blue one. I was just trying to think of like a 2001 thing that sure, I might have sure, yeah. not the whole because the whole thing with Napster for me was I was like I buy records yeah but then there's other stuff where I'm like well maybe I don't want to buy that like so maybe I don't like no, I wasn't we were one of those similar dorks where I was like I'm only using Napster for bands where I only like one song yeah or like maybe I check an album out and if I like it maybe I'll buy it I wasn't like some kids I knew where they were like just downloaded the entire discography of Western music right. yesterday yeah. And I have it on this hard drive. And now I can listen to it all the time. And I'm like, but how could you possibly listen to all that? And they're like, who knows? But I've got it. Like, I mean, I think the big deal, though, 
really was if you were into like underground or totally. out of well, issue was, music yeah. or hard to find music. Not all of a sudden you were like, skits, I, would I don't have to longer. take a yeah. bus yes. into the city and like go Tape through trading. like the now second hand record, record, record of the village. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I could just, 100%. Man. I could just discover anything. It was really yeah. mind blowing. Napster was a big deal. I'll admit it. I'll, you know what? I'll admit it. That's Napster right. had some impact. On Very big of you. Um, but uh, he's empowering to Zuckerberg mm -hmm. in, and in this movie's perspective, I think it's like, you know, he's a pretty, maybe villainous is too strong, but he's an insidious character, Correct. obviously, because he's encouraging, you know, I mean, Peter Thiel shows up, a yes. normal and chill man in real right. life. But even in this movie, you kind of get the sense of like, right, you know, like this sort of cocoon is building around him. And he's, he's Zuckerberg with style. I don't just mean visually, no, with but like in, in the way that Eduardo panache. has the finesse that he does not and how to interact with people, even if he's being brash, it is in a way that is compelling, which Zuckerberg is not interpersonally. And when like Wardo is like, he is bad and we shouldn't be aligned with him. Right. He is from the, from a business perspective, so completely wrong. Yes. From the emotional perspective of the movie, you're Correct. like, yes, this is, yeah, you're right. Like this, these are not good people. And you also know just like, yeah, they're just going to make Facebook, which is bad. <laughs> like, yeah. That's the other part that you're sort of thinking, the longer the range gets, like the, for, the more this is an older and older movie, yes. you're just like, yeah, Jesus, somebody stop them. Right. We got to stop Facebook. Elections are going to get fucked up because of this. <laughs> right. In like but multiple countries within the world of the movie, it's like like there there maybe even could be a scene where Zuckerberg sits, sits at Eduardo, Eduardo Severn down and goes like, "We don't need to make money right now. There no. will we will get venture capital. This is how the <laughs> fucking Silicon Valley works. We didn't invent this. That's an right. old model of finance." Mark like, knows this guy by reputation, but the second he sits down at the table and he watches how he interacts with everyone there, especially with Eduardo's girlfriend. It's like, well, this guy has immediately Brenda Song, become by the way, shout out. Really absolutely good. hilarious in this movie. Really so fucking funny. Good. In like a fairly underwritten Sorkin-y lady character yeah. who's just like into uh, Wardo for two scenes and then crazy for two Set scenes. Shit on like, fire. Yes, but she's um, so funny. The, the second Zuckerberg is actually watching Sean Parker exist in person. Right. He's like in awe. Zuckerberg is just like dumbstruck. It's become his entire mood board of this is the realization of who I've become. Mm -hmm. who I want to be. The this version the of me that makes the most sense. Yes. I'm going to have my business card say what, I, what is uh, it? Which CEO is a real thing. Bitch. Tim CEO oh, bitch. That was a real God. thing that Zuckerberg did. Yeah. Again, as you said, Griff, like he really presents himself like only around when this movie's coming out. I was like, what do you mean? I'm the most normal guy in the world. I love to wear t-shirts and shorts. Yes. Real meat. You know, got a wife and kid. I'm not like one of those normal CEOs. I'm not stuck up. And then you hear like, I'm oh, he got guy. business cards printed saying I'm CEO, bitch. And you're like, well, that's pretty crass. And then you're like, I, I guess he was 20. <laughs> like, I, I guess I, also, I should it's remember. Just, yeah. It's was, so like, funny. A child. <laughs> In the way that like you watch the the Fire Festival documentary and everyone's like, Billy McFarlane, it's, the guy was so magnetic. When you're in a room with him, he could sell you anything. And you watch the interviews and he's like, uh, I had an idea to make a <laughs> concert. Festival uh, the night fire. With <laughs> right. <laughs> Where you watch video footage of Zuckerberg and you're like, how could this guy ever sell the swagger of the like asshole little stinker shit he's doing when it feels like he'd be like break into tears coughing in public, <laughs> right? Like of embarrassment. If someone you caught see him it, sneezing. Like the Aaron Sorkin scene where right. like, what is that? Uh, you know, and he's like, it's like a glottal stop. You know, obviously Zuckerberg's right. trying to tank that meeting, I think is the idea. But he did shit like this but all the time. It's weird, yeah. Like, yes. And anyone who's not like Peter Thiel, who of course is very normal. The most normal. Uh, By the way, he's funding this podcast now. We should make it very clear. No. Uh, he's our only sponsor. No. <laughs> Every, we have to do three ad reads. It's like, Peter Thiel, what I like about him, normal. Normal guy. <laughs> but like Peter Thiel can look at Zuckerberg and be like, you know. I don't like him. He's given us no money. Yeah, I don't like him either. Uh, you're the kind of freak, like, I understand. Like, you know, sure. you know I get that this is the kind of person who makes yeah. a fucking website. But like some Madison Avenue ad exec would be like, what the, what are you wearing? Like, can you make yes. eye contact with me? Like, you know, like, like imagine Don Draper <laughs> meeting Zuckerberg. Oh. You know? Yes, but that's like, suplex that's him. what this guy exists in it, it, to be in opposition to. Obviously, it's Sorkin in the Glottal Stop scene. He's perfectly cast. He's really funny. Yes. I think Sorkin should act more. 
I honestly do. Yeah, and maybe direct less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's 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 bring these sliders down. <laughs> I need to be willing to be like Sorkin. You can be the lead in your next movie if someone else directs it. Oh, um, thing I was going to say. Uh, it it is like a Luke, I am your father type thing. Whereas plays out in the movie, and I've seen this so many times, and I forget every time that this is how it works. Million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool. Eduardo says, you, and then it cuts to the deposition. Right. And Eduardo is the one who delivers the line. Right, right. It, he doesn't actually say it. He and does it say, cuts drop, back the, to the drop silence. the hood's cleaner. He yeah. does say that. It cuts back to the silence after he said it. But I have such a like implanted memory in my head of, of everyone thinks Timberlake, Timberlake says leaning that. in and saying a billion dollars, which you never see on screen. Um, but of course, that is that is a Parker is again right where he's like, you guys have to stop thinking about this like some cute little thing you made. Like there are billions of dollars at stake with yeah. this idea. I love, and I'm sure you guys too, the nightclub scene so much. The Fincher esque choice of. The music is loud, it is, and you can barely hear what they're saying. I feel like it's the only it's movie the only time ever anyone's ever done this. And it's I been mean, 13 years, and everyone should be copying people it. People have obviously done, like, nightclub scenes where the music is loud. Yeah. But they're all about no dialogue. The atmosphere is overwhelming for whatever reason. Someone's losing it. Someone's yeah. having fun. This is just like, no, these two guys are having a regular business conversation. Yes. It's just at a nightclub where the music is so fucking annoying they're screaming at each other. And it's not just the volume of it. It's that weird intensity of like, you cannot have a subtle conversation in a place where music is playing this loud. You know, I go home from like nights at bars and I go like, did I sound like a fucking moron? Because everything I want to say, I had to yell. I had to go like, and the thing you have to understand is he didn't really get his blank check until his seventh movie. And like, that's what he's, he's telling this sorkin -y tale of the yes. Victoria's Secret guy. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg even has that joke. Like I said, was that a parable or whatever, you know, like, right. but like, it's, I, I love that scene. So Timberlake's so good in that scene. I mean, Zuckerberg plays all the Timberlake stuff. Great. Because, I mean, yeah. Eisenberg, because he does actually seem like odd to be in the room with him that's what I was gonna every say. time. His, right. You also, you realize it's one of those things where it's like uh, power in absence you realize this character's basically not listened to anything anyone has said to him the entire movie, right? He's almost always looking somewhere else, deep in his own thoughts, immediately dismissing it. And then it's only in these early Sean Parker scenes where Zuckerberg is like captive. He's leaning forward. He's reactive. And as you said, it's like a little boy meeting Spider-Man. <laughs> like it's like yeah. he's looking at him like it's like I cannot believe I get to be in the presence of you. You are the coolest person I've ever met in my life. He's so blown away by every new revelation, every like insight. They, when they're the dinner scene where they're like testing their competing theories on what they should do, right? And Parker has the line where he's like, so which of us is right? And he's like, both of you kind of, you know? Right. He's like, you're both kind of right, but for the wrong reasons. The things you, the thing you guys don't understand is that what you have right now is cool and it's indefinable and you need to just run with that. Which is like what they did. And the more he explains it, the more Mark keeps going, like, yes, 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 exactly. This, this is what I was finally saying, finally. saying yes, what yes, I haven't yes. been able to articulate. He won't stop seconding everything. Now, again, it is so ironic to consider how uncool Facebook became. Yes. Like, but because this movie now you watch it and you're like, Facebook, cool, but it was right. cool. And that it is this ineffable thing of like, it's cool. People want to be on it. It's cool. But it stayed cool enough. Like the Blank Check Patreon. Like that's what the Blank yes. Check Patreon is like still, now. It's still cool. It's exclusive. it's exclusive. No, it's it's the difference between MySpace and Friendster. Is it stayed cool enough to achieve total world domination? Where then when the floodgates opened, it was like, yeah. And there's so much stuff that like, you know, a couple of years ago, like 10 years ago, now I feel like this is the exact same shit that fucking Musk is trying to do with X where they were like, Facebook should be the one used resource for used for everything. Play video games? Do it on Facebook. It should be your Buy wallet? Buy stuff? Do it on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Right? It should Live be... Live your digital life on Facebook. Right. Live but here... you can't have legs. Right. It's, I mean, it's the Zuckerberg them. line. We used to live in uh, farms, and we live in cities, and we're going to live in the internet. Right. Right. And I think a lot of people were like, this is nefarious. This is like Big Brother shit. He wants us to like hand over all our information, which to some degree does because he understands that the ultimate currency and that's the ultimate value they have as a company is possession of all of that, right? 
But there's the other part of him that truly, I think, believes like that's the better way for humans to live. Right. Well. Right. Like he wants that. He thinks it's good. I mean, the fact that many years later he went, he was like, we're going all in on meta. We're going yes. all in on this like virtual reality universe because that surely isn't that we've what we've all been waiting that's for. The thing. It's not that. He and thinks then like everyone's reaction yes. to this is like, no, we weren't waiting for this. Like, we don't want to live on the fucking holodeck from Star Trek, bro. I know you might. It's not that he thinks he's doing a good for uh, mankind. No, he's just It's that he can only idea. see the version of the world that he wants to live in, which he's like, I'd like to log into one thing and have everything solved for me, and then I live in, in the holodeck. Maybe we like, should go all in on it, though, right now. Meta? Yeah, get yeah. into the metaverse. Yeah. What if our episodes become metaverse exclusives? That would be great. It would make us lots of money. Yeah, so instead of video, it's like you can be immersed yeah, and video, video podcasts are old news. Yeah. All right. I want people to be right here in between our tables. And we'll all appear as Sims. Yeah, and I have bunny ears. We'll all be David Sims. Yeah, we'll all be David Sims. Yeah. Uh, sure. Me. Yep. Yep. My likeness. Mm-hmm. My perfect man. Okay. I'm, well, the, I'm the baseline in this world. Let's move on. Yeah. Well, I'm not the perfect man, to be clear. But physically. Thank you. Mentally. Ben, ben is the perfect man. That's true. So, oh, yeah. Um, sure. Physically and mentally. <laughs> I agree. The end of this film obviously is the the Let's sil- go to LA. huh skipping at the end already. Well, not the the, the final uh, act of the film. They moved to California. Silicon Valley. Yes, yes. Is, the, is them in Silicon Valley. You do have uh, in Harvard, I believe, the triumphant. Is it in Harvard? The triumphant coding scene. Oh, yes. where the people are all like hacking, just like a hackathon, and the yeah. best one will get to be in Facebook. And Mark, you know, checks his code and is like, "Welcome kind to of Facebook," and everyone flips out, and you can feel like for the first time in his life, this he feels guy is cool, cool in a room. Exactly. Yes, it's such a powerful scene. Like yeah. you're, 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 and it's it's impressive and scary. Like that shot of him standing there smiling, you're kind of like good for him, and you're also kind of like. Oh my God! Like he he's like becoming a god. Like that's this the is, thing this I is think Fincher terrifying. is really bringing to this. Right. Is like it's the meek shall inherit thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, combined with absolute power corrupts absolutely. Where it's like we used to think the dominant ruling forces in the world were the wrong people, and what if the power could be redistributed? And if you give it to the people who have this chip on their shoulder about the world doesn't value me enough, right? I'm not saying the oppressed. I'm saying the people who feel self oppressed or socially oppressed, not actually oppressed. Mm-hmm. If they get the power, we will all be in the firing rage of their vindictive wrath. Sure. Their contempt for humanity. You know? Basically, like, people grew up being like, why doesn't anyone think that I'm smart? Why doesn't anyone appreciate that I'm smart? Why don't they value that over... Why don't girls like me? Correct. He just knows that's like, right, you, you hand it over to those guys, you give them the ability to rewrite everything and it's not going to turn out well for anyone just want to point out too that while this uh is taking place is the uh chicken ongoing thread but do you know what i'm saying it's like yeah. he's he's designing his own challenge right the drinking challenge the coding challenge sure because there's so much jealousy yes about the fact that Wardo has been invited on the way to the you yeah, know, membership. on his way to be welcomed to into the room, yeah. and then he feeds the chicken some chicken nuggets, and this is called cannibalism. I believe this is a real incident uh, of some. I believe this actually did happen. Yeah, got written up in the Crimson or whatever. Yeah. I mean, my favorite Garfield line delivery should have gotten the Oscar nomination for this alone. Is you know, don't the fish eat the other fish? The marlins and the trout. It's so funny. It's referencing them talking about marlins and trout like 15 minutes earlier in the movie. I love it when screenplays do that. Yes. Where you're like, that's why those words are in his head. It's because they had that other conversation that didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah, Alex Ross Perry talks about that a lot. The, the Sorkin thing. The oh, yeah. Not that specific, but the magic trick of like presenting something to you, circling it, underlining it, putting it right in front of your eyes, leaving it there on the table and then for an back hour. To it. Right. And later. then when you get back to it, it still somehow feels like the audience is like, he oh, surprised shit. you. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Even though he couldn't have made it more apparent. Yeah. Uh, um, Silicon Valley stuff like the, the the maybe the clearest funniest version of Zuckerberg's like inherent awkwardness never leaving him is the beer. The beer. Him so. throwing the girl at the beer at the girl is funny. Yes, she misses it, smashes, and then he just throws another Again. one. <laughs> Every other person would be like, "Okay, she's not in the business sure. of catching beers." But also, that's his. I'll buy more beer. 
I'll keep Certainly. throwing it until you catch one. Who gives a shit? It's well, beer. The, the whole vibe in this house of is like a very like lame kind of chaos of like they're making a mess. And Parker <laughs> like, walks in no and he really says, it up. "This is perfect. This is exactly what you should be doing." And he's right. He's like, like "You should be living like fucking idiots." <laughs> it's just like like coding. fucking lost boys, right? And yeah. like then just like diving into the pool with your shirt on. Like that's right. really all you. But need he's to like, do. "This is the ethos from which this company gets to a billion dollars." And like you say, Wardo shows up and he's like, "I've been kicking my ass." riding the subway. I was waiting get... outside the airport in <laughs> right, the rain. Right. Yeah. He's such a pathetic creature and you feel for him but then like you are kind of like why aren't you here? What is? What are you yeah. thinking buddy? Like you, what, you needed to do your Lehman Brothers internship? Like who fucking cares? No I think he feels like I, I think both A I need to at least set up the tracks for the yeah, conventional this career path if this doesn't happen or B I use what I gain from the real world to help this business. Rather than understanding this is the moving train, there's no need to lay down tracks anywhere else. Right. Just stay on board. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I think, truly hurts Mark. It hurts Mark because, correctly, Mark is like, you don't believe in this. Right. And Wardo would probably be like, well, yeah, who knows? Like, this might not amount to anything. Yes. And Mark's like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm already resolute that like and this Parker is And Parker reads it immediately. He goes, he went to New York. Yeah. Yeah. So you're up. telling me he's not here? He's missing all this? Look, when you read about the reality of this situation, it is in retrospect insane. Because you're like, yeah, he made a thing. It was a phenomenon. They were getting hundreds of thousands of members. He moves yeah. to Silicon Valley. And Eduardo Saverin was like, well, I think I want to like, you know, do my Lehman Brothers internship and then yeah. like go back to Harvard. Right. And... And then, like, by the time they cut him out, which the movie dramatizes this way, but, like, mm -hmm. and there you, you can read emails from Zuckerberg where he's basically like, he's not even answering my emails. We're just going to fuck him. We're just going to cut him out. Yeah. And they cut him out by just making a new company, right. having the new company buy the old company, and then completely changing the shares. And, yes, they knew he would sue them, and they knew they'd have to settle. Yeah. But they did it because they were just like, we can't make business decisions. He's not here. Yeah. And, like, that's just how he got fucked over. And then he went to Ben Mesrick and was like, I got fucked over. And this movie was born, and it's a masterpiece about yeah. toxic masculinity taking over, you know, a certain kind of toxic personality yeah. taking over how people interact with each other for the rest of their lives. Yeah. All because one billionaire got screwed over by a bigger billionaire when they were 19 years old, basically. That's just funny to think about. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. You agree with me? I was trying to process a cannibalism joke about the fucking chicken and Army Hammer they're in the same movie, and I drafted like 40 versions, and none of them were worth Remember repeating. Keep Fucking That Chicken? <laughs> yes. That was so funny. What's the other one? The, it, it, takes, it takes a tender man to fuck a chicken, or what? Do you know that one? It's one of those like famous news bloopers, it and I think it's a Mr. Tough G. Man to make tender chicken right. is, is the, maybe the Purdue is the line. Right. right. And then Mr. G, the local New York City <laughs> newscaster legend. Mr. G. This was a couple years before he retired was trying to quote that and said something like, it takes a tough man to fuck a tender chicken <laughs> on the news. And you just look at his My favorite. co anchor aghast. aghast and course. then he has to say, like, I apologize I for the so comment sorry. I made. So, I mean, it's always good. That's you know, a tough man to that's fuck kind a of tender chicken. what this early Facebook era is the same yes. era where like what did like these YouTube exist for? It's like to watch Clips of local newscasters say right. something weird. That is why we have You were talking about the face smash scene and, and people leaving the party to go to this website. You were like, is that realistic? I remember touring colleges, right? And I'm like at the fucking dorms. I'm at the fucking frat houses, like parties with whoever was like, give me the guy. And I'm like, I'm trying to see what the social life is he like here. He, uh, 17 year old, right? Trying to hang out with college students, see if I could fit into this place. My my strongest memory is being drawn into a room in a dorm away from the party where everyone was drinking and it was just people watching YouTube videos. I mean... For like two hours. It was certainly true all the way back in college, yes. Someone would be like, hey, can I show you a YouTube video? You'd watch it and then suddenly it's like, oh, this is our night. We're just right. going to keep finding more to watch. Hey, like, what, have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? You this know. feels like the fun room to be in. <laughs> Well, for Griffin Newman especially. Joe Breezy Patron Chug. That's where I discovered that. Have you guys ever done keg stands? Grapefall. No. I've never done a keg stand uh, because I, it, I, 
I, it's so disgusting. <laughs> I'm more of a keg sit guy. <laughs> and I do love to sit. Or Sitting a, is the opposite of standing, lean. of course. There's nothing more exhilarating than getting no. up there. There are things there that are, are more group exhilarating. Sex, gambling, well, yeah, affair, of various drugs. Have you ever Casting. funneled a beer? I have done that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have shotgun to beer. How shotgun. I was I didn't have a stop. Baby, I would be able to do it under 10 <laughs> seconds. There were those people who could like open their throat, you know, and it would be like, oh, it's so cool. In Britain, there's a yard of beer. Are you aware of what a yard of beer is? No. Uh, which is, I believe, I believe well, it's. No, of course I am because I almost went to smart. You college. went to Cambridge, right? You were wait, <laughs> you were waitlisted at the good college. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, a yard of beer is two pints and you get served it in this sort of like, you know, six foot long, like thin mm -hmm. glass. Oh, and you're sure. supposed to go like, you know, like, you know, it's sort of like that. Sure. Gross. Yeah. Ugh. I love a beer. I love, you know what beer's for? Sipping. Flip cup? Flip cup? I, I played flip, flip cup. cup. See, this is where I... Look, I played beer pong. I love drinking and I hated when sports got involved. It's true. Even low level. I see. And you, you know, know what I'm saying? Who, and I'm it's like, true. The people who really love that shit were jocks. Correct. Yeah. And I'd be like, I finally have like a fucking social lubricant. I have a thing that like knocks my anxiety down a couple rungs. <laughs> and, and now I have to like and hangout situations. And have use hand eye coordination. Yeah. In, which by the way is game of skill. bad when I'm sober. <laughs> have I ever told this story? It's I, very quick. I don't know. But like middle school, one of those sort of like scared straight uh, health class were teaching you the dangers of drinking, showing you videos about drunk driving or whatever. And the teacher brought out drunk goggles which are sort of like safety goggles that have lenses adjusted to make it look like what it feels like if you're like blackout drunk. And they huh. put a tape line on the floor and they were like, one by one, everyone's going to walk this line. And then you put the goggles on, try to walk the line with the goggles on. And this is what it feels like to walk when you're drunk. And the bit was, it was like watching Legends of the Hidden Temple or whatever. You'd watch it and you'd be like, but I'll fucking nail it when I get up there, right? <laughs> I got up there and they said, okay, so now walk the line without the goggles on. And I fell down. <laughs> you couldn't even do that. And then I said, okay, well, give me the goggles. We're, no, we're not going to wait. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's an auto fail you don't there, get buddy. To, you don't get to wear the goggles. <laughs> and I think they finally let me. This is, I can't believe I haven't brought this up. This is like a really kind of totemic story. Uh-huh. <laughs> in, uh -huh. in my adolescent years. Uh-huh. I think the teacher let me put the goggles on as long as I held her hand. Oh, like, I mean, like she, had she had health and safety to worry about. about. You know, while you're breaking your neck, trying to learn about drinking. Anyway, yeah, I don't like beer pong. <sighs> so, um, obviously, the um, the coup mm -hmm. that happens right in front of Eduardo's face is he gets cut out of the company. Yeah. Um, when he returns to Facebook to celebrate their million users, it's when he finds out. You know, suddenly and, you have no you're, shares. You're sort of the timelines, not the timelines, but the the sort of three narrative strands of the movies are starting to speed up and get closer and closer mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Almost, almost Dunkirkian. Sure. You know? Temporalities. Yes. And, uh, you know, Mark smashes his laptop. Yeah. I, it's look, it's, it's, uh, not to reduce it in this way. And I'm not even saying it's the it's the peak of his performance because I think the real strength of it is in a lot of the smaller moments we've discussed. But this is the scene where you're just like, it's kind it's it is astounding, even in a tough year that he didn't get the Oscar nomination. It's also he's already been cast as Spider-Man by the time this movie comes out. Is that true? Yes. He gets cast in July, the movie comes out in September. I mean, Pascal casts him off of you know, having seen the finished film, worked with him, but he's testing for it right after this movie is basically finished in production. Yeah. So, like, this movie comes out and it's one of those things where everyone's pointing to it and going like, and by the way, this guy has just gotten one of the most coveted roles in Hollywood. He's going to be a star. Uh, he had that, like, emerging star heat around him. And then this, this scene is just, like, such a, a knockout. Uh, it is the, uh, what's the line? Um, the fuck you flip flops. There's uh, so many good ones. Sorry, my product is the cleaners along with my hoodie and my fuck, fuck you flip flops. You pretentious douchebag. Yes. Says it to Sean. Um, and look, uh, uh, Andrew Garfield, who has a tendency to cry or at least be on the verge <laughs> of tears in performances. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is put to great effect here. Yep. Nope. 
like him having to deliver the Gatling gun. felt betrayal. Sorkin delivery. He doesn't have time to wallow in it. And he looks like... But he's just maintaining just on the brink of complete emotional collapse. But he also looks like he's going to cry during the entire deposition. Yes. You know, anytime you're cutting he back to him. He genuinely hates this. Like, Zuckerberg's sort of like, this is annoying. Right. Right. I should be back making Facebook. And yeah. Eduardo, it feels like, is like, how did we fucking get to this point where right. we're on opposite sides we of this friends. table? I gave you. He you makes know. Sean Parker flinch, though. That moment. I know. It's so good. It's so good. It he is. seems like actually genuinely intimidating and he really he scares he really scares and Garfield has a moment where he like relishes it before he even says the, you know what I like about you Sean it's staying next to you it makes me feel tall there's a moment where he like does the fist and then he sort of like licks his lips and is kind of like oh that worked you know yeah movie ends you know, Sean Parker gets busted with coke sure uh, I'm trying to think of the other any other it, final like, elements here's a phenomenon in this movie I, I don't know if we've ever mentioned I don't I don't know if it's ever come up in reference to another film. But like that scene has that feeling where I and maybe it's at this point because we're so conditioned to like so many of these types of stories have now got drawn out into eight hour miniseries. Mm, very true. But it doesn't feel like that scene is like, oh, and by the way, this movie's gonna be done in less than ten minutes. Sure, you might there might be like an hour left of this movie. You're right. building up such a head of steam. There's something about the fact that this movie like gets out at its peak. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's set up these threads. It's able just to tie back in the two depositions and get out. Right. This is so close to the ending rather than having like 20 minutes of unsatisfying sort of like bow tie. Then in. this happened, then this happened, then yeah. this happened. Doesn't matter. And Doesn't of course, matter. crucial decision for this movie given that there was so much more to happen anyway. Of course, but that's the end of the main emotional crux of the story they're telling. Um, Rashida Jones uh, swoops in to say like, yeah, you know, this is all pro forma. You are right. going to settle with these people. It won't matter to you in terms of money. You are going to, you know, be very successful. And then, you know, the big Sorkin-y line of like, you're right. not an asshole. You're just trying so hard to be. The mirroring the Erica Albright, like it's because you're an asshole. Right, which I think is Sorkin trying to retain the audience's sympathy for this character and him to reassure page, right. he is in fact a nice guy and then yes the way Fincher um, there's a lot of interesting talk in, in all the David Pryor documentary shit about the Fincher 100-200 takes stuff right which we talked about a lot in the Fight Club David has pushed his microphone fully away from his face no I, I was looking at some quotes okay. I'm looking at because this is such a quotable movie yes. that I just want to make sure we like mention every quote that we haven't already. A lot of these young actors talking about uh, uh, what it's like to work on this many takes, right? They said like the deposition scenes were the ones that were nightmares because you're like just in that box for like two weeks. There's so much dialogue to get through. They You're going to do so many takes. Two days. Too. Seems like, this like is a that. Very long shoot. The amount of fucking coverage you have to do for how many different people are sitting at different sides of the table from every angle or whatever. It's like it's like two consecutive weeks of just going around that table. It does make you feel like you're going insane. Probably in the way that like psychologically you feel on like hour six of a deposition, except you're on day ten of it. But all the actors kept on saying there's something kind of nice about it, and especially Fincher being able to work digital at this point in his career where the hundred takes thing doesn't feel like it's excruciating and like he's beating you into the ground, it almost feels freeing where it's just like, you're just doing an extended rehearsal and you're filming all of it. And Eisenberg, who's like, I'm a very self-critical actor. I'm very neurotic. I'm constantly questioning myself. I go home at night. I think I should have done it better. There's something nice about being with a director where I know he's not going to move on until he has it. I feel like it takes a lot of the pressure off of me. And it takes the pressure off of any one individual take to have to be the thing, which I really like. And Fincher has talked about the moment he cites as like, this is the reason why I do 100 takes is, um, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said this thing of like, actors, they prep the thing the night before, they do it a bunch in the mirror, they come and they go, that's going to fucking kill. I'm going to nail it. That's my big move. And you get in there and it's sort of hermetic, Right. And it's two people who prep different things that right. isn't Feels working. Rehearsed. They're not reacting And the circumstances are different, all of that. And there's a certain degree which you need to like beat things out of their system to which it becomes a routine. You've said the word so many times that you're not even thinking about what you're saying. It's just like deep in your bones. Mm -hmm. And that's when these little things come out. 
that you couldn't get otherwise. These tiny things I'm like looking for. It's sort of much like we talked about with Kubrick, where it's like he's not doing 100 takes looking for them to achieve a thing he's waiting for. He's looking for them to do a thing that surprises him. And there's the moment in the opening Erica scene where she goes like, Mark, listen, and she keeps talking and he leans in. He goes, Erica, like vindictively, he sure. says her name back to him. Yeah. And Fincher's like, that's like the kind of fucking moment I'm looking for, which he only does on one take. It's such a weird, bizarre thing that I only get if I'm filming it that many times and I'm like cross shooting it and whatever. Right. Sure. And so there's a lot of like, yeah, watching him direct people, them talking about how much they appreciate being able to go through it. When he's directing Eisenberg in this final moment of refreshing the page over and over again, which I believe it seems like was the last thing Eisenberg shot in the entire movie. Kind of cool. Was his total rap. In, in, in the documentary, you do see pretty much everyone getting like wrapped out, right? You know, like, yes. and that's a picture wrap on blog. You know, yeah. Okay. Although they just said the last day of filming was like three insert shots. Uh-huh. And Fincher walked up to Sorkin and said, I'm going to do You're the first two. One. I'm going to get in the car. You direct the third yeah, one. Which is cool. And he was like, that was him yeah. trying to help me as a director, which maybe we need to hold him accountable for. Yeah, maybe Fincher's canceled. Actually. Maybe don't give him that much confidence as a director. But um, he was like, you see him over Eisenberg's shoulder kind of doing the similar bullet points of like, and here are the things, remember, that's factoring into this as you're refreshing and this and that and whatever. And he's like, but here's what I want. Give me a take, just all that in your head. Give me like nothing. Give me nothing. I don't want you to play any intent on this. He's like, I want you to play this in a way where we can read whatever we want on your face here. But there is something to the way he constantly, and a lot of it's the score as well, but also the way he shoots uh, Eisenberg, who has like very odd angular features. He's almost always lighting him in this way where like his eyes are lost in shadow under his brow. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm Mm-hmm. And and he's he's physically playing the role like he's some like Grima worm tongue or something. Sometimes. You know, he's like it always feels like he's almost like recoiling away from the camera at odd angles. And there's something about that refreshing and the way it actually plays out that stops it from being a cute ending, especially in the wake of the Rashida Jones line that maybe aims to exonerate the character. Or at least, you know, realign our sympathies exa- with him. No, I think it, I don't know if it's real. I think it's just, I think that we can talk about the intent. Lines. But I, I think this ending does make him feel so thoroughly pathetic. It's pathetic. And you're like, it all just still comes back down to this, like, that's, one fucking I think feeling in this Sorkin's guy that's broken. Take. Yes. That, I don't think I Sorkin like is like, this Finster is a thing. good guy. I think Sorkin is like, the, the, a lot of this isn't out of malice. It's out of an inability to connect with people. I like, don't think you know. that Sorkin thinks that he's a good guy. It's why I'm interested in him saying, is the audience still rooting for him? Because I think he's still worried about audiences are going to bail out on this movie if they don't like this guy. Mm-hmm. And Fincher recognizes that they're telling a much larger story. Right. And that it doesn't matter whether anyone likes this guy or rooting for him. Right. This is sociological at this point. It's not about audience sympathy for one person in the personal journey. You know? It's emblematic of a much larger thing. Which is why it's important that, like, this final moment is just such an empty husk thing of just, like, all of this for nothing. You know, the final, you have these sort of uh, inner titles over him refreshing and refreshing and refreshing, catching up on a lot of He's the settlement the youngest deals. youngest billionaire in the world. Everyone got, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah And then yeah. cut to black. To what end? He still just hates the fact that she won't acknowledge him. Made a badass website, though. Yeah, and You can it find out if someone's better. in a relationship or it's complicated, for example. Huge. You know, they had their favorite favorite yeah. quotes. Fl- flip some dank Pepe memes. All right, let me see if there are any, like, funny lines that we haven't thought about. I mean, mm-hmm. there's 6'5", I'm 6'5", I'm 220, and there's two of me. Uh, if you were in the ventures of Facebook, we would have you would have invented Facebook. I saw that. I think we did a good job, I'm realizing. I do like the... Uh, Best podcast episode I don't even know who the time. I don't even know who the speaker was. It was Bill Gates. Shit, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Every, every little part in this is so good. Yes. Right? Like every two-line performance is so good. And some of them are yes. people where you're like, oh, and then he went on to become oh, Caleb Landry Jones. Yeah, right, 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 right. But for as many of them, I'm like, that guy nails his part so fucking hard in a Fincher uh, movie. Drop the... Where's uh, he now? Did we say drop the... the just Facebook? Well, I, I we did at the beginning of the that. miniseries. It was funny. Everyone um, liked it. You know... Um, wait. Let's see if there's... A, 
Mm-hmm. You're just going to just stroke your beard and go through every... It's a, it, David, it's a lot of quotes. It's a very long... I went through it last night because I at one point I thought I was going to type out a longer page's long intro. I was going to go full let me be frank and do more extensive word replacement. It would have been awful. You and I arguing over... Open your presents. Who created to sell blank scarf. Yeah. Have you ever seen me wear a scarf? It'll be your first. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really funny. That I guess no. That's the only thing we didn't talk about is this, like uh, the the humbling of Sean Parker, him getting busted at the party, where it's just like the second cops show up, it's so pathetic that this guy is here with the it interns. Is. Aside from interns. it being creepy, yeah. Well, that's why. It's, where you're it's just pathetic. like this guy still for how much Mark looks at him is like he has it figured out. He fucking dates Victoria's Secret models. He still wants to impress the exact kinds of people who would have dismissed him in high school and college. Of course, the real Sean Parker famously had a wedding that cost $10 million and was themed after Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry, President Summers, but what you just said makes no sense to me at all. I'm devastated by that. That's so funny. He's got this, like... I was the U.S. Treasury Secretary. I'm in some position to make he's that He's got film. this, like, almost British lilt to his voice, which is very... I, I don't know if he spent a lot of time in Britain. Gary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm devastated by that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just... I'm saying we should move off of the quotes page. No, I we're don't done. Think this we're is done. Good. We're okay. Done. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we really did hit everything. That's a good job by us. Shot for 72 days. Just going to clear up if anything else in the, uh, um, dossier. Yeah. They didn't, mostly were not allowed to shoot on Harvard campus. Harvard didn't want them to. So they mostly used John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. But of course, the shot through Cambridge, uh, yeah. you know, Harvard doesn't own most of that property that he's jogging through, so they could do that. Uh, They built a battery-packed light cart that they would, like, follow around with him to, like, light the scenes, like, you know, which is cool. They also, there's that shot when he's leaving the bar and you sort of, like, pan across downtown Boston with a bunch of the Harvard buildings. It's where the social network title comes up for the first time. And that shot is entirely constructed of, like, super high-def, uh, uh, images taken like piece by piece because they he was like Harvard was antagonistic to us right yeah. tried to block us in every way right and so they ended up shooting around as much as they could building sound stages going to other places whatever but like that shot's basically constructed of like 15 shots that they visually all tiled together and had to be lit individually not by the cart I don't know if they use this for that uh, for some of these other sequences as well, but it, this is just Jordan Cronenworth was talking about this. Um, for that, they had a mime who had a backpack with all the lights on it to That's stay cool. right outside yes, of the they frame. Had a mime. Yes, they did have a mime. And he was yes. like, why a mime? And he was like, because cops are going to be trying to shut us down and Harvard will have them on warning. If it's a truck, if it's a crew guy, they'll stop without like any hesitation. If it's a mime, they're going to be so confused about what's going on. And it will basically have at least two minutes of them trying to negotiate with a mime and being like, do we have to let them finish their routine before they actually shut it down? There's also something kind of fancy about miming. Yeah. That it fits a little bit like on campus. But Cronin with the the DP was basically saying like, it's great that on like a $40 million studio movie, there's something still kind of like student film, guerrilla punk rock and Fincher wanting to like psychologically break down how to get the movie made, not just assuming all the resources in the world. I know also when he signed on to do this movie, I think Pascal was like, we have this budget for $20 million. Mm -hmm. And Fincher was like, I need 40. And they were like, this is a high school movie. This is a college movie that mostly takes place in rooms. We have no big stars. Why does it need to cost $40 million? And he was like, look, I know I have this reputation for being like going over budget, being exacting and all this sort of shit. But like, I don't waste a penny. I read the script. I know exactly how much it's going to cost me to make it right. I know the time I need to do everything. There's not a piece of equipment I ever rent that I don't use on the day. I don't leave things on the truck just in case. Like, this is the amount of money to do this correctly. And you watch a lot of this David Pryor shit. And I'm just like, no one fucking gets the bandwidth to make movies this way anymore. On any level, where you watch the amount of rehearsals he does of like Brenda's song fucking lighting the fire. Did a good job. And like the fucking camera tests and the wardrobe tests and all this shit where it's just like, this is a movie for how much Fincher said, my style in this was trying to have no style. There's no lighting setup that took more than 15 minutes. I'm trying to be an obtrusive because it's mostly the dialogue and the performance is carrying it. He had time to just finesse everything to the point of being exactly correct. Trent Reznor. Yeah. 
introduce him through doing a Nine Inch Nails music video, obviously, uh-huh. working with him on Seven. Uh-huh. Bringing him on board is maybe the most influential thing in the movie business that he did. Yeah. Basically, the most iconic score of the decade and then launches him. So mm-hmm. copied, you yes. know, and then, of course, their own career is amazing. Yeah. And his, um, it is uh, ongoing, diverse and yep. diffuse. And yeah, when I interviewed them, when I interviewed everyone who worked on Mank, they were the people I was obviously the most terrified to talk to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Trent Reznor is really soft spoken and quiet and kind of tough to get an answer out of. And Atticus Ross is the most lovely, garrulous British guy ever. Who's just like, Oh yeah, you know, we had some trombones on this one, you know, like the opposite of him. Sure. So they must have some weird, yeah, you know, creative chemistry. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Box office game. Box office game. This film was a hit. Yeah. Gross 97 million, just short of hundred. It's kind of a shame they couldn't push it to a Honda. Uh worldwide 225, but mm-hmm. against a budget of 40, so it did very well. A movie that will play forever. hundred percent. One of the most rewatchable films of modern history. It opened at number one on October 1st, 2010. $22 million <laughs> opening weekend. September really was first nope. October. Okay. Uh first week of October. And it's number two. What do you hear on the wind? Hmm. Hoot. Hoot. It's not the Owls of Gahool. Gahool! Flapping in on its second weekend, Legend of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahool. Oh, wow. At what? Well, in its second weekend, they've made 10 to add to their total of 30. Okay. Um, But they are holding fast at number two Mm -hmm. because number one has dropped to number three, a much maligned sequel, long-awaited sequel, a legacy sequel of sorts Hmm. uh, to a... Oscar-winning 80s drama. Oh, it's Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. No money. <laughs> you never sleep. Not on Wall Street. Oliver Stone's Wall Street too. A movie as uninteresting as its title is incredible. <laughs> Terrible movie. Uh, has also made about $35 million. A mm-hmm. bit of a disappointment, that film. Although, given how bad it was, it actually did fine. Yeah. You're like, given what a piece of shit this is, <laughs> should be happy you made a dollar. When this came out, it, there was some stat that like Shia LaBeouf had had seven consecutive number one openers or something like that. Right. Yes. Yes. And Shia LaBeouf had this just brutal quote where he was just like, yeah, but look at the movies I was attached to. I don't give myself credit that Frankie Muniz could have opened all these movies to number Poor one. Frankie. He was like, three Transformers, Indiana Jones. All right. Wall Street. They would have made the same money with I'm realizing Frankie Muniz. We need to order food. Okay. Um, but okay, number three at the box office. But you're right. A uh, horrible burn on Frankie Muniz. Yeah. Um, number four at the box office is a great, you know, again, sort of grown-up drama. It's, mm. a, it's a thriller. Okay. Um, made sort of similar to the It's opening Network. or it's a September release? It's a September Hold release. On. Okay. Uh, but did similar to, you know, made like a 90s domestic. It's an R-rated film, though. It's an R-rated September 2010. What what studio released the picture? The Warner Brothers. The, the Warner two of them. The Warner Brothers film. In 20, it's not The Town. It, it is, is The, the town. town. Ben Affleck's The Town. A great film. The Town. Yes. Um, number five, a rom comedy mm. for teenagers. A rom comedy for teenagers. In 2010. From the good people. Sony Pictures. Ding. Was it Screen Gems or was it Sony? Is it Easy I believe A? It's, it's a yeah. mainline Sony. Right. It's Easy A. Right. Uh, with Emma Stone. Another star, example of. I mean, I guess Pascal super bad is star making. A but superstar. Given her vehicle. Who knows? She might win her second Oscar this year. We don't know. It could happen. Uh, some other films. You again? Oh, yeah. You again? I kind of like you again. Really? I've never seen That's the Kristen Bell one, right? With uh, Betty White, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Jamie Lee Lee Curtis. Curtis, They're they're all tearing up uh, pictures. Yeah. Who's the other young woman in that? Adet Yes... Annabelle? Adet Adet Yesman Annabelle? Adet Annabelle Yesman? Okay. Someone... Can someone just like take a little... uh, you know, uh, paperclip and I reboot. I swear to Griffin. God, something I said in there was correct. I think you're right. Uh, she went through a couple names. Number seven opening this week, a movie called Case 39. I feel like that's one of those like much delayed that movies. Was, I think that's a Renee Zellweger. Yes, Bradley Renee Cooper Zellweger. It was one of those film. things that was shot in 2006. Yes. <laughs> it came out four years later. Yeah. Opening to $5 million. You've also got Let Me In. Matt Reeves has let me in a huge bomb. Yeah. Opening at number eight. A movie I contend is very good. It's a good movie. It's, Obviously it's not, not as good as the original, it's but not. one of the better 
American remakes of a perfect movie that never needed to be remade. Right. Uh, definitely needed a TV show. Number nine. Well, uh, that's where they finally cracked it. Devil. Yes. Oh, M. Night Shyamalan presents Elevator Devil. You know, they often say the devil's in the details. I find the devil's in the elevator. Uh, number 10. He's in the elevator. I missed that one. What if someone in the elevator is the devil? Number 10, an animated film I have never heard of called Alpha and Omega. Oh, yeah. David, it's a Lionsgate, Lionsgate. release. Yes. It's I? sort of Balto runoff. They have made like seven direct-to-video. Alpha and Omega is the new land before time. Ben wants to do something. Oh, I just wanted to guess. Was the tagline going down? Devil? Are we going to end the episode on that? I think I think the tagline for that one was from M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, I will, of course. he produced it. It was based on his story. We've talked about on his miniseries. People think people he directed it. Yes. And when his name the... would come up in the trailer, people would laugh. Uh, no, here is the tagline for Devil. It's a pretty ordinary tagline. Going down would be. Uh, well, there were actually two taglines. The first one, bad things happen for a reason. Weird tagline. Bad things happen to good elevators. Uh, the second tagline, which I think was more trying to hit the elevator thing, was uh, five strangers trapped. One of them is not what they seem. It's like, okay, Jesus. Okay, we get it. One of them's the They're devil. in an elevator. Those are both terrible. Going down was Here'd way Here'd be my tagline. Better. Here'd be my tagline. Going down. And then you go down like to halfway down the poster, new line, all the way down. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll further down the there, poster. A further. This has made you look. I mean, down to hell. <laughs> That's where the elevator is going. It's going down to hell. And then it says, but this movie's good, though. You should check it out. <laughs> From the twisted mind of around $11. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right. I have to pee so badly, Griffin. So just take us out unless there's anything you want to say. About the social network, because I don't think we talked about it much on this episode. It wins the Oscar for score and for screenplay. And maybe editing. I think it had three wins. Is that right? But yeah, I feel like it's thought of as one of the sort I of remember great the score modern... win was almost surprising. You were kind of like, oh, good for them. Like, this is a different kind of score. Yes, like, yes. felt a little more modern than the, the screenplay score win felt goes. fairly sewn up. That like, felt done. Because it's such a written movie. Yeah. The whole campaign was, can you believe that Aaron Sorkin doesn't have an Oscar? It felt uh, inevitable. A little um, bit of that, yeah. But I feel like then, this one uh, is kind of our modern... Um, yeah, editing is the other win. Which is funny because then they, Angus Baxter and uh, Kirk... Kirk Baxter, sorry, and Angus Wall also win for Dragon Tattoo the wee year later. They won back-to-back sure. editing Oscars. It's. I think this is in that like Goodfellas Dances with Wolves pantheon. Yeah. Of just being like, okay, we enjoyed the like, King's Speech, the but hell? come the fuck on. Well, and like, with every year, the absurdity, Correct. like, it only grows. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because as much as, like, And Eisenberg lost to Colin Firth, which, you know, Firth's performance is very strong. Like, and he had given a great performance the year before. Like, there's a lot of love for him. Yes. But in retrospect, you're like, what the fuck Absurd. happened here? Yeah. You know? Like, it's just... Eisenberg would have been the youngest best actor winner ever. Wouldn't it be? He would have beaten out that goodbye girl. Yeah, RD. Well, or is like it Brody? Brody's like twenty nine, and Eisenberg was twenty six. I mean, I think you're correct that he would have been the youngest. I just can't remember if Brody took the prize from Dreyfus. Yes, he did. It's just because it's one of those things where you're like, Richard Dreyfus was thirty when he made the Goodbye Girl. And you're like, I watched the Goodbye Girl. The man is sixty five in that. Yeah, girl. I don't know what like you're talking dad. about now. <laughs> Lex G will sometimes <laughs> use the term aging like Dreyfus, <laughs> which it's really hard. Um, but yeah, obviously this film was uh, highly acclaimed and yep. the fact that it did so well just set Fincher up for the next few years. Yeah. Um, and it's good. I think it's good. I think it's really good. I think it's a pretty, pretty terrific picture. I'm on the record. Okay. We're, we need to end this David SP and we have to record another episode. We do. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. I think, did we shut down our Facebook page? I think we did, right? Or is it still there just to hold the space? Uh, it's, I think, inactive. I, I think, think it's inactive. I don't know. Let me look. Keep yeah, going. let's look into it. Thank you for our social media, Facebook included or excluded, and helping to produce the show. Thank you to AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing. JJ Birch for our research. Lane Montgomery in the Great American Novel for our theme song. Uh, Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds for our artwork. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon, Blank Check Special Features, where we do commentaries on film series. Right now we're doing the Pierce Brosnan Bond movies. 
Um, and also every 10 days, if you want to sign up for a free membership, we unlock an episode from three years ago, including the Alien series, which times into our Alien 3 episode recently. You can listen to all of those. How's your Facebook looking, Ben? Uh, well, it's not allowing me to look at the page. It's hmm. saying I must log in. Okay. So I have a feeling that we... It's not public anymore, and okay. it is, in fact, deactivated. I'll try logging in on my Sniffin' Poomin account that, once again, it has zero friends. Do not friend request me. It only exists well, we should just to sync. Well, I think it's funny, though. I want people to hear it. Okay. It exists to sync into Disney Emoji Blitz. I'm going to reject every request you send. You're going to get a bunch of requests anyway. You know it. Guess what? I never fucking log in. I don't care. You're not getting in. I have no friends, and I never will. Tune in next week for the girl with the dragon tattoo. She's got a big-ass tattoo, Ben. I know. She has incredible uh, looks in the movie. Uh, Marie just walked in. Hello. Hi. I was hoping in my time out where when Griffin thanked you, you would have walked in the I door. I know. It almost worked out. I'm also now, I'm like, does David leave the bathroom before I finish the episode? Can we be playing the Trent Reznor music over this, the outro, so it sounds really kind of like sad and haunted, or is that going to get us into copyright claims? We can recreate it because it's so sparse anyway. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Can we do, like, the blank check theme in the, like, Trent Reznor style? Absolutely. Okay, that's what we're doing. David's out of the bathroom. We're still going. We're still going. Griffin has stretched it out because Marie came in and... You know, I mean, we had to make sure that the episode was, you know, well, it is already three hours. It's three hours? Yeah, that's I mean, right. Three hours isn't cool. You know what's cool? What? Four hours. Perfect. Mr. Newman, do I have your full attention? No. Do you think I deserve it? What? Do you think I deserve your full attention? I had to swear an oath before we began this deposition. I don't want to perjure myself, so I have a legal obligation to say no. Okay, no. You don't think I deserve your attention. I think if your clients want to sit on my shoulders and call themselves tall, they have the right to give it a try. But there's no requirement that I enjoy sitting here listening to people lie. You have part of my attention. You have the minimum amount. The rest of my attention is back at the offices of Blank Check Productions, where my co-host and I are doing things make... Fuck, let me take that part again. No, you said doing things. No, that's not what I want to do. <sighs> I'm just going to take that part again. Or do you want to do the whole thing from the beginning? No, I was nailing it. Let's do it again from the beginning for rhythm. No. Yes. What? Do it. David, no, do I, it. Uh, David, do it.